Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor Ron Isom is with New Beginning Fellowship Church and he's here to lead us in the invocation. I'll, I'll add that New Beginning is an appropriate name for a, for a pastor who was displaced because of the May 20 of storms and then also his church being displaced because of the May 20 of storm. He's, a, he's, a, he's going to know a lot of our building inspectors, I got a feeling, over the next few months. But hopefully 2015 will I'll put you back in, 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 in the right side up, Pastor. We appreciate you coming down this morning. Thank you. When he's finished, I'll ask Councilman Pettis if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Father, we thank you for the opportunity that's still afforded to us to come before you and before this City Council to invoke your blessing and your presence upon this day. Lord, we thank you that our Mayor and our City Council still approves of coming before you. And so, Lord, today I pray for wisdom and courage and strength and anointing and blessing upon each of these who serve our city. Give them wisdom. You said if anyone lacks wisdom, they should ask of God. And so we ask you today for wisdom to pour out upon these uh, that lead our city. Give them a blessing today and encourage them and help their business go well as your presence is with them. In Jesus' name. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. We are approaching White Cane Safety Awareness Day, and we have Vicki Golightly, Sandy Webster, Mabel Stripling uh, to come on up. We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. Whereas the white cane is used by hundreds of Oklahoma City residents who are legally blind in order to navigate our city and access its public places, schools, and businesses. Whereas, with proper training, people using the white cane can enjoy greater mobility and safety by determining the location of curbs, steps, uneven pavement, and other physical obstacles in their path. Whereas, the white cane has opened the doors of opportunity to thousands of blind Oklahomans by enabling them to travel freely and independently in their communities. Whereas, the white cane is now universally recognized as a symbol of blindness that improves the safety of blind pedestrians by alerting drivers when a visually impaired person is crossing a street, parking area, or other areas open to the public. Oklahoma law requires drivers to come to a full stop at least 15 feet away from a visually impaired pedestrian using a white cane or dog guide and to take such precautions before proceeding as may be necessary to avoid accident or injury to the person who is wholly or partially blind. Whereas, to honor the many achievements of blind and visually impaired citizens and to recognize the significance of the white cane in advancing independence, the United States Congress, by joint resolution, approved October 6, 1964, as designated October 15th of each year as White Cane Safety Day. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim October 15, 2013, as White Cane Safety Day in Oklahoma City, and he urges all citizens to observe this day by recognizing the significance of the white cane, both as a symbol of independence and as a simple tool that enables Oklahoma City residents with visual disabilities to participate more fully in the social and economic life of our city and state. Let's show our appreciation over White Cane Safety Day and our reminder of, of different precautions that we can take. And Vicki, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I'd just like to thank the mayor and our city council for annually entertaining this proclamation. It's a very, very important public awareness event. We're walking at 10 o'clock around the Spaghetti Warehouse area in Bricktown. 
we appreciate the opportunity. I also, there's two things on the agenda today that are important to us, this and bus shelters, because transportation is extremely important to blind and visually impaired people, and actually all people. But thank you so much for having us. We wanted to, I did invite my councilman, Shadid, uh, to walk, but unfortunately, our walk coincides with the city council meeting. <laughs> but maybe next year we can do something different. Thank Vicki, you. thank you. Let's show our appreciation again. And October is being recognized as National Arts and Humanities Month. And uh, of course, this is taking place all across the country. And here locally, we rely on the expertise of Robbie Kinzel, Julia Kurt, Deborah Center, Amber Sharples, Peter DeLisi, Ann Thompson, and Jim Loftus. And there, Peter is here. I was going to say, I don't think Peter's with us this morning, but he, presto, there he is. Come on up, and we'll, we'll get settled up here. And we have a, a proclamation that the clerk can read as well. Whereas the month of October has been recognized as National Arts and Humanities Month by thousands of arts and cultural organizations, communities, and states across the country, as well as by the White House and Congress for more than two decades. Whereas the arts and humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind. Whereas the arts and humanities are important to our quality of life as they enhance and enrich the lives of every American. Whereas the arts and humanities play a unique role in the lives of our families, our communities, and our country. Whereas the nonprofit arts industry is important to our economy as it generates over $135 billion in total economic activity annually and supports the full time equivalent of more than 4 million jobs. Whereas, in recognition of the great importance of the arts and humanities to our citizens, the City of Oklahoma City has adopted a 1% for art ordinance created a liaison position for arts and cultural affairs, and commissioned and implemented cultural plans for the city. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of October 2013 as Arts and Humanities Month in Oklahoma City, and he calls upon all citizens to celebrate the arts and culture in our city and encourage greater participation by all citizens in taking action for the arts and humanities in our neighborhood schools and all areas across our city. Let's hear it for Arts and Humanities Month. <laughs> Deborah, we're so proud of how far we've come in these areas. We, we certainly have. Over the last decade, our, our entire city has changed uh, with the number of arts groups represented. Um, the advances we've made, the advocacy for the arts has been tremendous. On behalf of all of my arts colleagues, we definitely want to thank you, Mayor and City Council for uh, allowing us to be here today to share the excitement of the arts and as you heard the impact with the jobs, uh, certainly the economy, uh, the number was over 113 million but um, statewide 486 an annual impact. So uh, we thank you for that and anybody want to add? We thank you for allowing us time with each of you today to express our uh, love for the arts and our commitment to this city to continue to improve the arts. And again, October is Arts and Humanities Month in Oklahoma City as proclaimed by the City Council. Thank you all very much. Let's show our appreciation again. Thank you. Still under office of the mayor, I wanted to officially thank Pat Ryan for serving as the vice mayor for the past six months. I brought a token of my appreciation, but she did an admirable job. And uh, you were gone last week when we officially installed Councilman Greenwell as the new vice mayor. So again, appreciate your service, Pat. Um, we also have an appointment of uh, Carl Springer to the Oklahoma City Metropolitan Area Public Schools Trust. And so we'll be uh, voting on that shortly, if not right now. Let me pull out my agenda and see. 
let's see. Yeah, we have two appointments. So um, Carl Springer would be added as 3B, and we have 3A as listed on the agenda. Is there a motion on the uh, appointments? I just, just a comment. Uh -huh. I, I wanted to just make a comment about because I, since I've been on the on the council, we haven't really talked about these appointments, and there's a steady stream virtually every week of these about maybe about 680 appointments to 75 different boards, trusts, and commissions. And I've never never heard us talk about that process. When I look at the, the makeup of Oklahoma City, it's about 54% Caucasian, 18% uh, Hispanic, and 16% uh, African American. And I've asked Francis if there's any way to kind of track you know, who, if there's proportional representation in these appointments, and she told me there wasn't. So I just kind of went through them myself, and I'm, you know, there's some guesswork uh, using Hispanic surnames, and and when I when I'm looking at the roughly 680 appointments, I noticed that there's about 33 that seem to be uh, African American, that'd be four or five percent, but only of, of those 33, 22 of the 33 are by four people. Angela Monson has eight, Myron Coleman eight, Russell Perry and Kevin Perry have three each. I think uh, Joe Clytus and Gloria Griffin have two each. So you have 22 of the 33 by, by just four people. Um, when I look at the Hispanic and Latino communities, it's worse. There's only seven that I can find, at least with Hispanic surnames. And when I think that there's over 100,000 people in our city with, um, uh, of Hispanic and Latino origin, I think there's got to be more than seven people that are qualified to sit on these boards, trusts, and commissions. Last week we were at the at the ACOG and at the re, uh, regional transit dialogue. Decisions that will profoundly influence economic development in the greater Oklahoma City metro area for decades to come. And seeing new routes that I haven't seen before, like going through Nichols Hills and Village on the way to the Edmund. And I look around the room, there's 50 people in the room making this very, very profound. And there's not one minority of the more than 50 people in the room, either on the RTD or in the audience. And I just, I think we can and must do better. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with these specific, you know, especially Janice Powers, who I think is an incredible asset for the city of Oklahoma City, but uh, I just, I think we can and, and do, must do better. Thank you. Okay. Was there a motion? All right, cast your votes. Pass unanimously. On item four is the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for October 8th. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for October 1st. Second. All right, comments or questions on the journal? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item 5 is a request for uncontested continuances. <clears throat> Mayor, on uh, page 15 under item 8A, that's SPUD 710, that's in Ward 5, the applicant has requested that this item be deferred until the January 14th meeting. I understand they've talked to Councilman Greenwell, he concurs. Which one was that? That's item 8A. Okay. Uh, on page 15 also, under item 8C1 and 2, that's a dilapidated historical. The owner's attorney has contacted us. The attorney's, uh, the uh, owner's attorney has, has contacted and asked for a deferral until November 19th. And uh, Councilman Sellier has has uh, been made aware of that. C1 and 2, 8C1 and 2. And then on page 16, under item 8D1, item E, 2517 Southwest 27th, we ask that that be stricken. That is now occupied. And item F, 1819 Northwest 42nd Street, we ask that that be stricken. Uh, the owner has secured that. All right. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? Can we go back to C1, to uh, 8C1 and 2? When, when was the deferral to? Uh, November 19th. We don't have a meeting on the 12th, which would have made it 30 Four days. Weeks. You're okay with that? I am. Okay. Mayor, we do have uh, two individuals signed up to, to protest the deferral. So it's actually an a contested deferral. A contested deferral, okay. so we'll have to consider it in the order of the agenda. Okay, so we should bring that up when we get to that part on the agenda? Okay. Fair enough. And um, 
It's also uh, an item I would like to move up to the front side of 8E2. Uh, Bill Bleakley is here representing the Oklahoma Gazette and the Halloween parade that is coming and asked if they could come up first. Linda's here as well. Looks like Linda's going to be the spokesperson. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Mielli. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Affairs for the Oklahoma Gazette. Uh, one of our affairs is the Gazette's Halloween Parade that will be here Saturday evening, October 26th. This will be our seventh year of having the parade, and we're all still smiling. Everyone is having a grand time. Uh, the route this year is a very similar to the route last year, uh, but for the fact that uh, North Walker uh, has some major construction going on between 8th and 10th Street. So we're moving the parade one block east. It will go down Hudson rather than going down Walker this year. Otherwise, it will be the same route, 10th, Hudson, 6th, and up Broadway. Um, we would be very happy if you would approve this, and we invite you all to come. It's a great event. How many years now? Is that about five years? Seventh. So? Seventh. It's our seventh Time year. Time travels fast. Yes, it does. Well, we appreciate the event very much. Do we have a, a, a motion on item 82, Meg? It's in Ward 6. Motion to approve. All right. Cast your votes on item 82, and it passed unanimously. Thank you. All right. We'll recess the council meeting convenes the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Looks like there are six items. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the MFA. Any comments or questions for yeah, council? I have a question on the item F F MFA C. Uh, this is one where the claimant appealed the, the um, order and got an increase in his order. Uh, did we, did we, the city, appear as part of that proceedings? Did we contest the appeal, or did we just let it happen? I, I can't answer to that. I don't know the specifics on it. Uh, it was monitored, and 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 if we. If we let it happen, it was because we, we thought that was the right thing to do. But I get you back, get back to you with some specifics on that. I have a sort of related question. Now, these people were all returned to duty after their accidents, which I think is great. Do we have a, a system in place to screen all our employees in terms of uh, making sure they're fit for duty when they come back? When you don't ask them to do something that might hurt them, aggravate their injuries. Craig, the question is: Do we have a process to, to screen all employees to make sure they're fit for duty after they've been involved in a workers' comp case? Yes, that's part of the process to ensure that, that they can come back and be back into their normal jobs. Okay, so um, we, and to ensure that, you know, if there's, if there's any issue or question, then that is addressed um, when they you know, are trying to return back to work. That we make sure that they have that ability to do the jobs that they've done previously. And, 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 and uh, do we have any light duty program to, to bring those people back to the payrolls and not be in a job lesser? Yes. Demanding yes, we do. It's, it's not in every department. There's some yeah, it's situations department where it's department. Okay. Hey, right. Yeah. It's, it's some situations where it's more difficult to do that. But sure. anywhere that we can, we offer that and encourage that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Ready to vote the MFA? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA. Convenes the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. One item. Move the item. Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, just the claims in payroll today. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second, and we have one person who has signed up to speak. Um, Ron Walters. <clears throat> Good morning, Rod. How you doing? <laughs> this is kind of your fault. You guys got this rule that if I sign up, I can get my three minutes in court here. Uh, Ron, we'll need your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Record. Ron Walters, 8501 South Walker, Oklahoma City. Uh, this morning I would be ghetto builder. Uh, I'd like to speak just real quickly on the Strategic Neighborhood Initiative. Guys, this item that uh, has been brought up and it's been before you guys, it's huge. Uh, we have the opportunity to bring back a neighborhood that has lost its way in our city. Every one of you guys in your district has a neighborhood in that condition. 
Uh, the city is focused on all of their efforts. We're going to go in there and throw some new sticks and bricks up, but we need some help with three other items that's going on over there. One of them we refer to is what we call the booms down there in this JFK area. There's a, one of these metal recycling plants or whatever that crushes items. My model home is eight blocks away. It knocks the pictures off the wall. The uh, housing authority people, their clients in there jump on the floor thinking it's moral bombing all over again. The Bricktown Motel, six blocks down the street, has had windows broke out. Uh, they hear it as far as the hospital. Uh, we've got complaints over there. We've got this documented, you know, to extreme amounts. They, these guys, it's an international conglomerate of guys. They've defied so many of us, I had to write it down. The DEQ, OSHA, EPA, Skip Kelly, the city attorney, code enforcement, the fire department, police department. Guys, this is our town. This is our town. If we can't fix this, something is wrong. Number two, this moon school situation sits right in the middle of this neighborhood we're about to go in. Shame on us. After 15 years, the courtyard being boarded up over there, Boeing's people went in, their own employees went in and unboarded this and brought this courtyard back. KIPP Academy is on the second floor of that, is setting records with their performance. On the first floor of the regular school moon, there's a new principal down there. He's just on fire and making things happen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to be passionate, but we've got stuff going on downtown here. We're paying, we're paying consultants to consult the consultants to consult the consultants to consult the consultants, and we can't fix this school. The latest move I hear from John Pettis is we're going to take some money from the playground fund of all the other MAPS programs and move it over to Moon and try and do a little something over there to get at least some handicap access on the second floor. <laughs> Shame on us, guys. Item number three, code enforcement. I'm trying to buy a house right across the street from where the city is about to dump a million dollars of their money into this program. This house sits there with we've spent $1,020 boarding it up. We've mowed the grass for the last four or five years and filed liens against it. We've allowed these people to pay $58 a year in property taxes when they get in the mood to pay it, which hadn't been for a while. We've got to step up code enforcement to take these back. If you think I'm going to be able to move people into these neighborhoods against falling down trash crack houses, good people ain't coming there. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Councilman Shadida, I brought this up in the meeting a couple of weeks ago, a week or so ago, and he uh, uh, the issue is here is you're voting to give me an additional thirty, fifty thousand. 50000 I don't know. You're giving me a total of 450000 to go into this area. He accused me of deflecting from the issue, you know, but it, it, that's really not true. The point is, guys, I'm here this morning to tell you don't vote for this. If you're not going to back us up, don't send me into a gunfight with a knife. There's only those three things only you guys on the shoe here can fix and take care of. If you guys aren't going onto the field to play with us, don't vote for it. We can win this one. We can bring this neighborhood back, and there's a bunch more neighborhoods after this we'll bring back. I'd like to congratulate planning, has worked with the neighborhood associations, the churches, the individuals in the community. They've planned houses. God knows they've rejected my plans three times to get them just right. They're doing their part. They've done everything. We can win this one, guys. But we've got to have your support. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Council comments on the consent docket. Yeah, Pat, and it looks like Meg's raising her hand. Pat? Uh, your Honor, just a question on item uh, 6E, and it's a resolution authorizing the purchase of stuff. And the vendor is accessories, it's well with an X. Uh, is that a spelling a accident, or is that the way the vendor spells his name? I believe that's correct. Well, I think we ought to try to find a vendor who can spell rather than <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Honor. All right. Meg? Yes, Mayor, I had a couple of things today. Um, six, item 6A is a request for proposals um, to bid for some alarm monitoring systems. And the final sentence in the memo says the city desires a move toward a system that will not be proprietary to only one manufacturer for services and repairs. And I'm just curious, is there such a thing? I mean, I've never installed an alarm system that was not proprietary. I don't know how we find one of those. Uh, maybe somebody from Berkshire okay. can come in and answer that. That'd be that. fine. It's not a huge question. I was just curious about it. 
Um, That's a real important question, Matt, because we well, spend an awful lot on sole source providers, right. and I think we need to, to try to move our whole city operation towards doing more of this work with generic equipment so that we don't have to rely on sole source providers. Uh, I think we are sort of captive at that point, and we pay what is necessary to bring those people in regardless of what the price is. And uh, I think we, we need to look, I think, at more generic kind of uh, systems. Maybe we even have to put them in ourselves rather than have a, a supplier put them in, but I think we'd be money ahead in the long haul. Amy, can you respond to that? Amy Simpson is our purchasing. I heard the first question, but I didn't hear the... My question, Amy, was just is there... Um, equipment that is not proprietary. We believe for there is, okay. and we're certainly going to seek that through the RFP. The system that we currently have is proprietary, and we're having all kinds of vendor issues, so we don't have a lot of leeway because no one else can work on their system. So we're trying to find out if we can change that. Right. I mean, I agree with Pat to to end up with these sole source providers. If something happens, we're really in a jam. We've seen it with radios. We've seen it with some other things. So. Um, but just from the buyer's research, we do think that there might be manufacturers available where other companies can actually monitor their alarms. Great. Thank you for looking into that. Um, my second question is also about a purchase, and this is an RFP for two uh, police helicopters. I thought I saw Chief in here just a second ago. Yes. Um, Chief, are we planning on purchasing both of those at the same time, or do we stagger the purchases? They'll be staggered. Okay. Thank you. It didn't reference that in the memo. Uh, a third thing, and these I just wanted to, to mention um, a couple of things. Um, item 6P um, are our emergency solution grant funds uh, that are awarded um, on an annual basis. And I just wanted to mention some of the um, awardees here. I think it's important for folks, we don't get to talk about social services all that much around the horseshoe, and I thought it was important to mention some of the grants that the city is involved with. Um, the Homeless Alliance uh, Housing Locator, the Homeless Alliance in the Area of Coordinated Case Management, Red Rock Behavioral Health Services, the YWCA of Oklahoma City, Neighborhood Services Organization, City Rescue Mission, both in the area of rehousing and in the area of prevention, um, Heartline, Community Health Centers, Sunbeam Family Services, Legal Aid Services, and, you know, I just think that's a very representative list of lots of the folks in Oklahoma City that are really helping to address a, some of our most challenging issues. Um, the city also funds a series of grants within the planning department um, that are directed at social services. And those awardees are Heartline, the Homeless Alliance, Traveler's Aid, uh, which is uh, now known as Upward Transitions, Oklahoma City Metro Alliance, which runs um, both the First Step programs and our um, detox facility, Community Health Centers, Positive Tomorrows, um, which is that amazing school for homeless children, uh, Neighborhood Services Organization, and Legal Aid again. And so I just wanted to make special note of uh, those organizations that are receiving funding from the city and working on some of our most challenging issues. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? Just one, one minor comment, Your Honor. On, on, on AK, uh, this is, it involves the Potts Park and the Greens and uh, do some improvements out there. And I think uh, we need to recognize the people in the Greens who operate that park. They're doing a great job, a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, a couple of years ago, they got all new playground equipment out there because they came up here and just protested over and over again about how unsafe the equipment we had out there was. And uh, they're very interested in this park, do a great job. It's a, to me, it's an example of what a neighborhood park should be like. It's a pocket park where people can take their, their kids and walk there and uh, utilize facilities. Really a great age. All right. Ed? Well, and I just want to make sure you know that I think that's a very healthy and well said use of deflection. But I, I want to take up one issue he brought up with Kenny. Can you, can you talk about if you have this industrial use that's consistently, I guess they're measuring the decibels of noise and it's consistently being measured outside of our, our noise ordinance, what, what options does the city have? As I understand it, I think they are crushing the cars with gasoline in the tanks and that's what makes the explosion. Uh, I believe code enforcement has tried working it for noise. I just talked to Bob Teener and he said, but they actually haven't observed, caught them 
the actual explosion in one of those instances. Uh, they worked it for noise. Uh, I haven't researched state law, so I, I don't even, I can't, I find it difficult to believe that they can actually legally crush the cars with the gasoline and the tanks. Maybe that's legal under state law, but uh, we can look at that. I don't, I don't know who in my office has, has looked at it. No one has actually mentioned it to me. Um, Bob may know who they've been working with. We've had meetings before about this, and, and really our understanding is that they're supposed to take the gas, the tanks off before they crush them. Uh, the problem with the enforcement is that we're not there when the explosions or the, the loud noises go off, so we can't prove that they've done it. And you can't really measure that with our decibel meter because it's a one-time explosion and it's a random event. So, I it's mean, we're kind of... It's gone on for so many years, we know it's an issue. Uh, but what, what do you just... Because you're not there, you don't catch them in the act, we have to allow it to just continue for... Well, we'd have to meet with the counselor if we could write a ticket after one's happened to try to get maybe a neighbor that heard it or somebody to testify. Part of the problem is this property is owned I-3. It's our heaviest industrial district that we have. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that can go on at that property that make some noise. Right. Right now, based on the noise, it could only be a disturbing of the peace complaint, and it'd have to be signed by someone who actually heard that and was disturbed by it. Now, I, I had the great opportunity this past weekend to attend the Neighborhood Association, JFK Neighborhood Association. They actually do keep track of um, when they hear uh, those noises. Um, we, they actually have several individuals, property owners, who keep uh, track. As a matter of fact, um, Bob, you, you actually have a staffer who stays in the JFK area, and she actually keeps track uh, herself as well. Uh, Charles just told me that there's actually three of these companies there, and we, and, you know, it's hard to tell which one of them is doing it. Now, we did have a meeting with them a while back, and they, you know, they tried, they promised us that they would stop and make sure the tanks were gone, but apparently it's, you know, it's an ongoing event, <laughs> and it's a random event. Could And uh, there was a lot of discussion ahead of the rezoning application about how to prevent this. And they entered into, those people entered into an agreement about what they would do. I mean, it's in writing. They haven't opened the, the, the recycling facility yet, uh, so we don't know whether they're going to do it or not. But, um, but there, we went into a lot of detail with them about avoiding this very thing because that's the big complaint about these is crushing them with gasoline in them. They don't have to have much gas. You need to take the gas tank off because uh, the, the, if there's just even a small amount of gas and the vapor that's in it, the gas is, will, will create an explosion. So. That one is, that was done through a PUD or a special permit. Exactly. I'm not sure which we, one we I, had I, those I, conditions. There is a vehicle somehow, though, somewhere in that there may be a, a, a partial solution to this problem because we negotiated with them, the neighbors negotiated at length with them about about preventing this very kind of incident. Wouldn't there be some type of monitoring system that could be in place, whether it's strictly audio or audio and visual, to monitor the activities at this yard? I mean, we could, couldn't we, set up some kind of a monitoring device? Well, part of the problem with that is having a staff person to, to monitor it. Because well, I, it's a, a random event. But. Yeah, I don't mean for a person to be out there, but isn't there some kind of device that could be developed that would just monitor from an audio perspective or audio Yeah, session? like the videotape in, yeah. a, in a convenience store. Sure, you have it in security systems all the time. Why couldn't we modify it or, or provide at least the, uh, the audio portion of it? We could, but, it, but I mean, would, that be, would that be a basis for you to do any enforcement? Not on a disturbing of the peace, someone has to be disturbed and then have to sign the, the complaint, whoever is disturbed by the noise. And then, then our other aspect of our noise ordinance requires the actual monitoring, excuse me, monitoring of the decibels. And that has to be done by a person who monitors the decibels and then can testify as to 
that the decibels exceed what's permitted in that particular zoning district. And I assume right. where those decibels came from. Correct. Right. Mr. Cornett, so, I, I can answer that question. We, we spent $2,600 hiring somebody with that delicate equipment. And we have records of millions of bits of uh, sound actuation. But the reality is I think the ordinance or whatever the laws read, we need a camera and that sound equipment or whatever. But yeah, we have that and we have hundreds of people who will sign complaints. It, it would also seem like a disturbing the peace type issue as well. Uh, right. And a public nuisance at some point. I mean, if it continues to reoccur. Well, can, can your staff write a list of options for us to consider? Yes. Yes, we'll, we'll do that and, and get it back to you here in the next week. How much of it is because they're I-3 as opposed to, I mean, is there a fair difference between, I know there's a difference, but is, is that a key to why they're able to get by with more noise, more? Well, the I-3 allows the, the noise ordinance, the decibel levels, I-3 can be the loudest, create the most noise. Now, the actual crushing the cars, uh, new ones that come in, I believe, require a special permit in C3, I mean I3, where we can put conditions on them. But these right. have been long right. existing uses that, you know, we didn't, we didn't get conditions that when they started. So we would have to be able to come back through enforcement or something. To yeah, I'll, I'll put together two or three people to work with Bob and Charles and see if they can come up with a solution to it. All right. Any other comments or questions from the council on the consent docket? All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. <coughs> We're on to the concurrence docket. There are three items. Second. All right. Comments or questions on the concurrence? All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We're on to item 8. <clears throat> item 8A has already been deferred at the beginning of the council meeting until January 14th. Item 4B is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. It's like we have one person who has signed up to speak. Uh, Terry Redkin. your name and address for the record, please. Terry Rudkin. I'm living right now next door to that, 814 Northwest 91st. Okay. Are you the property owner or you live just live next door? Uh, I'm the property owner. Okay. And my name is Sean Shibwell. Uh, speaking with Terry about what we're, where we are on the progress with the building uh, at the other six. Okay. okay. It's uh, in Ward 2. Ed, do you want to help them out? Well, we've, uh, we just got back our uh, chemical test for the sheet of siding uh, for asbestos test. Our contractor uh, recommended that. Uh, got a copy of our contractor's uh, recommendations, prices, and stuff like that. So we've been working on the, prog uh, on the project. Uh, so we're kind of now at a place where our contractor can take over with the foundation work. It was, his biggest concern was that the exterior siding that was done over the original shiplap siding uh, was asbestos based and we just got that report back yesterday uh, so now he can move forward uh, is, is there asbestos no there was no asbestos okay. so we don't have to deal with that price issue and when's the last time somebody lived here it's been my home for almost 70 years okay it's an historic house it's a shintaffer house yeah, but uh, he was one of the founders of Britain. I call him, he was to Britain what Gaylord was to the city. He is, it's the first edition to Britain, hmm. the Shintaffer edition. 91st Street was Shintaffer Street when it was Britain. There's no alley in that block. He didn't want it. He had a piece of the bank. He had a building on Main Street. He had a button factory someplace. 
I'm not sure what all he was in. What about what staff? Well, as you can see, it's, it's been kind of added on and fixed. We could find no building permits in place for any of the repairs that have, have been attempted so far. Sounds like, you know, that they're going to do something about it. But the foundation is bad. It is leaning, as you can tell from the st porch structures. The, uh, it's got the roof, it's got a bad roof on it. Uh, we're more than prepared to work with them. They can present uh, their their work and what the, their plans are, and we'll be more than happy to work with them on extending a time out if they're going to repair it. So you recommend leaving it on, but trying to yes, we nail down the, the plans and yes, and work with them over the very past. successful at doing that in the past. So okay. How long do you think the work would take? Uh, once our contract is start well, probably about two years, is what he was saying. The whole thing, because we're also trying to do the historical preservation and get it on the register, uh, being the only Victorian house in Britain Park edition. Uh, this was done, I think, uh, the building was built, what, uh, 1904? Uh, 1906, 1907. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with over a 100-year-old house, Victorian house structure, uh, that we want to bring it back to its original condition. So. What, what would the budget for that be? Well, right now we've got about $140,000, uh, but we're looking for more money, <laughs> naturally. Okay. So you, you said you've owned it for 70 years, right? So what, what, is, what has caused the, the property to go down as, as, it, as it has? Man, hailstorm. Okay. In May, four years ago. <laughs> Tennis bowl, grapefruit size hail. So is that that's still your recommendation? To it's still my recommendation. We can work with them. We'll review what they present to us with their contractors. Uh, it's it's had years of neglect to get in this condition. It's not just one storm or two storms. It's been years getting in this condition. The uh, the restoring it, of course, we're not looking at the, the full restoration. We're just looking for stabilizing the the structure and getting it sealed up to where it can, you know, it can pass the, get it off the demolition list, of course. And that shouldn't take two years. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it on, and if you'll work with our staff and start showing some improvements along the way, but but keep in touch with them and uh, make sure that you're doing it inappropriate. You're, you're putting us in a tough spot. This is obviously a historic building that all of us would like to see restored and, and we don't want to see it go away but we also have responsibilities to the rest of the neighborhood too to make sure that it's not a safety issue so um, we're, we're inspired by by your intent but uh, we have responsibilities as well so uh, if you'll work with city staff hopefully we won't have to deal with it again good luck thank you sir uh-huh thank you all right um, do we have a motion on the dilapidated structures? Okay, how about a motion then on item 8B? Any other people here to speak under the public hearing aspect of 8B? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8C, um, there, was a, there was a request to defer the item to November 19th, but a couple of people have shown up to speak for a non-deferral. Debbie Blackburn? Okay. Um. Mayor, could I possibly uh -huh. set the stage for this sure. a little bit, and then I'd like to hear from everybody. How are you today? I'm oh, glad good. to see you here. Good. How are you all? Great. Uh, this is a very complicated uh, situation. On um, it, The address of the property is 121 Northwest 22nd Street. Um, it's in Heritage Hills East. It's a historic um, neighborhood. This house has been dilapidated. Um, for a very long time and is um, very concerning to the neighbors and I know that's what we're going to hear today. Um, the situation with the property is that it's in currently in litigation. The house was acquired um, for uh, past due taxes um, some time ago and ownership is somewhat in dispute. Um, we've been working through the process and Charles and his group have done a fabulous job um, you know, I think this really um, is an example of something that kind of falls into the category of what we're working on with vacant and dilapidated houses. But we did get a request yesterday from legal counsel for the owner um, to, to uh, defer this for 30 days 
And I think it's important for me to say on the record that uh, these neighbors I know are particularly concerned, live next door, have been working on this, Debbie's been working on this for years, but there are also folks in and around the neighborhood that aren't quite as enthusiastic about seeing this property taken down. And my decision to allow a 30-day deferral would be to give one more opportunity, number one, to clear up the ownership issue, because the gentleman that bought it, bought the tax title to the property, I think would like to restore the house. And secondly, it provides one last opportunity for someone in the neighborhood that might consider purchasing it and restoring it. So, you know, our HP commission um, isn't at all concerned about the shed, which is an ancillary district, an ancillary structure, but they do comment um, rightfully that the structure properly restored is a contributing um, a structure within the neighborhood. So I'm just trying to buy a little bit of time here, and that was the reason for the deferral request. So. Mayor, if I could add a couple of things. Yeah, sure. One is that it was represented to me yesterday that they thought they could get the title cleared within 30 days. I don't know if they can do that or not, but they, that was what was represented to me yesterday. And I do want to pass on Councilman Sellier's comments from yesterday were maybe 30, but it isn't going to go 60. So she was showing a little bit of deference to try to get the title resolved, but, but it was very clear that this was not going to be uh, allowed in, in, in more of a continual basis. Did I, was that accurate? <laughs> I don't do that. Oh, that guy had 12 years. I mean, I've been gone 12 years. My name is Maurice Taylor, and I lived next door for like 15 years. And I have a tenant in there with some small children. And the house is so open and dilapidated, the rats are coming into my basement. So it's been a, a tremendous economic um, situation for me I can't I can't do anything I can't sell and I can't rent uh, I can't rent the house so they've had a long time to get that together if I can get it together I feel like they can get it together I'm just up to my neck now I, I own over 30 properties in Oklahoma City I am a doer and I'm a worker my rent houses look better than that I know that, and I really yeah. I, I, I am. I'm just up to my I neck. At it. first, it was I had consideration, but now I just let it go too long. It's awful. It is awful. I just I I just disagree with giving him any more time. Thank you all. All right. Thanks for coming down, <coughs> Debbie. Do you want to say anything? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, my question is, what are we going to do in 30 days deferral? What, what is the point? This battle over who owns the property, the idea that anybody could rehabilitate this when I can walk up to the side and look in through the siding into the house, it's ridiculous. This house is not habitable. The, state, the Department of Health has put notices all over it. It's not habitable. They were in court two weeks ago. The plaintiff did not show up. The man, the counselor who asked, his attorney who asked for this deferral did not show up. And by default, the property went to the person who have paid, has paid the taxes on them. Um, councilwoman, I hate to disagree, but I can find, there is no one on that block that believes that house is salvageable or wants it to stand or to remain. It is an attraction for vagrants. Uh, my problem was that because this man was my neighbor for many years, I didn't do anything because he was on a downward slide. And this is what we ended up with. I, my question is, what are 30 days deferral going to do? This battle over who has ownership could go on forever. It's. <laughs> They didn't even bother to show up two weeks ago in court to fight for this property, and now they want a deferral because they know that they can get one from the council, having had association with the council. Um, this house is not, and I say this, my husband is the state historic preservation officer. We fight in this neighborhood to keep every single house standing. 
So you know that if I'm here today talking about that, that it's far gone because normally I am on the other side every time. We have, we have mosquitoes, we have rats. This guy is a hoarder. He, he is a track, he's putting stuff in the backyard now again. He's putting stuff on the porch again. I can walk up to the side and I can look in. My question is this. You may go ahead and defer to your former colleague because he requested this. But what is 30 more days going to do? Can he get title to this when he wasn't in court two weeks ago? Judge Dixon already defaulted on the, and said, gave it to the person who's paid the back taxes on it. When, you know, I always thought that my rights end where yours begin and vice versa. This guy is standing on my feet. He's in my face and I am tired of it. We have property I cannot, I'm, I would like to sell it. I would like to get it in shape, put money into it, and, and sell it to homeowners. It's not safe to do that. It's not safe to do that with this. And until this is resolved, and it's always been, well, it's in court. Nobody knows who owns it. We can't do anything about it. That is not good enough. If that's torn down, the lots in that neighborhood, because of the proximity to downtown, are selling for $50,000 just for the lot. So there is money that could be made. If he doesn't have title to it, how's he going to get it in 30 days? There's no reason to defer this unless we just want to be nice to a colleague. Um, I hope that you remember this. If you do vote to defer it, that in, when it comes up again in November, that you do something about this. This is a travesty. Debbie, could I just, a couple of things. One is I didn't suggest it was somebody on the street that was uh, concerned about the house coming down. It's other folks in the neighborhood, which um, is important. And I also want to say that you and I did talk about this um, on more than one occasion. And the legal cloud over who owns that property makes it difficult to take it down. And within 30 days, we will know who owns that property. Mr. Chen, who you just said gained uh, right to the property by default, is the one that said he wanted to fix it. He's one of the individuals that says he wants to try to he restore the house. He hasn't been by there in a long time. Okay. He's not going to be able to. He'll have to build it from the ground up. And, and that's a possibility. So this thing has been going on for, as you all said, probably 15 years. I've been directly involved with it with you for the last year. I'm completely on board with taking it down after 30 days. Well, well, the thing is, we've had many, we've, they've gone to court over and over and over and over and over for years, and it, it hasn't been resolved. Ownership has not been resolved. And this has been the excuse that the city has used for not taking it down. Now, I pledge to you today that this is the last deferral. I want to give them time to clear up the title, and after that, it's already been declared dilapidated. We can take it down. Yeah, how, are we, how are we assured that we're going to get title, Councilwoman? Well, either we have it or we don't. But it's been declared dilapidated. So in 30 days, regardless forward. of what happens yes. on ownership, you will go ahead. Yes. And why can't we do that today? Yeah. Because we've had a request to hold it in abeyance for 30 days. OK. So I'd make a motion to defer. Uh, have we I'll, already deferred it, or do we need to make a motion? No, we need a motion. We need a motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it, but okay. I do have some questions. Okay. Uh, procedurally, Charles, if we uh, did not defer this and uh, voted to move forward with uh, tearing this down, how long, I mean, when could you begin? Well, that's always an <laughs> iffy question, but probably the soonest that ever happens is about 45 to 60 days. And that's simply because of the permits that are required for our contractors after they've uh, successfully bid the project to obtain those permits, get the disconnects and whatever they need to, uh, to proceed before, the, before we can uh, grant them permission to take down the property. Well, okay, well, let's, let's play this out then. If we agreed to uh, vote to allow this to be uh, considered dilapidated and move forward, if something happened within those 30 to 45 days, you could put a stop to that procedure, couldn't you? 
we can stop it up until the time the bulldozer gets on the property, yes. Okay. And the owner also has an opportunity to go to district court and file a restraining order against us to grant him any additional time also. So that's always open to the owner. Well, given the uh, uncertainty as to who owns the title, I, I would anticipate that's going to happen. So even though I voted, I mean, even though I second the motion, I, I'm leaning towards voting not to defer this. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a motion to defer. Is there any other comments or questions? Yeah, Larry? Yeah, I got a question, Charles. Why is this any different than the one that was here earlier where we gave the gentleman, we said that uh, we're going to leave it on the docket, and if you show progress, we'll, we'll work with you. Why is this any different? Why don't we just leave it on the docket, and if they work it out in 30 days, that's one thing. If they don't, we've at least, uh, I think, sent a message, hey, we're serious about this. It's no different procedurally at all. It's just that the only make the only thing that makes this different is our HP commission has put, you know, has put comments that this is, you know, this house does retain historic value. That and that's their opinion. Um, our opinion is that we brought it. We don't. We do not think it has. It retains its historic value because of the condition of the property. That's why it's here. That's why we recommended it to go on the docket. But. Procedurally, there's no difference. I mean, the owner would have the same opportunity to file a TRO if we proceeded and they disagreed with us to take it to court, just like any other owner would. Well, not to disagree with my, my, my good staff person, but the difference is, is that there is clear title on one, clear not clear title on the other. And so that if there isn't clear title, then someone can't step forth with the direction and a plan to go forward with it without the clear title, whereas on the other property, they do have clear pot title, so they've got a plan they can execute that plan. And I'm not here to, it's a policy decision, but, but that's, that's what, how I would differ, differentiate the difference between the two, outside of the fact that one's HP and one's not. Do we officially notify the owners that we're moving forward if this were to be uh, voted to move into a dilapidated status? Yes, we would notify all the owners that, that we're aware of, plus any mortgages or any person that has interest in the property. And, and Kenny has said that he would have to notify both owners yeah. and the district court. Okay that we were planning to do this. Okay. So quick question. So the district court, if we voted to uh, go ahead and tear it down, so the district court, if one of the owners uh, filed a motion with the district court, uh, the district court can halt the procedure, right? Yes, that's a possibility. They could. My, our experience, however, with owners going to district court to try to keep us from tearing down what, what are obvious dilapidated buildings is that the court will give them a very short time period to get something done. So that might buy them a little bit more time, but it usually doesn't buy them very more than 60 days. If I may, Mr. Mayor, I would just like to remind the You'll have to come up to the front, Debbie. I would like to remind the council that this is not something that's just been going on for the last year or the last two years. This has been a 25-year downward slide. And initially, because of the property owner, and um, we cut him a lot more slack than we should have. We didn't want to lose the house. We let it go too far. And so this is not something... Uh, Representative McAtee, uh, Representative Councilman McAtee, that um, you know has been something that they were given ample opportunities. He's paid thousands of dollars in fines. Code enforcement tried, and he's paid thousands in fines. And he would go over and show that he was going to work on the house. So what would he do? He would get out and scrape the paint off, and that was to show the. the code enforcement that he was starting on it, he was doing something. This has been a long, painful odyssey, and we do not take old houses down easily. All right, we have a motion and a second to defer this item to, this, to uh, November 19th. Any other comments or questions from Council? 
All right. We ready? What, I have one question. Uh, one, I'm not sure there is a cloud on the title. I mean, they've been to court. The judge ruled in favor of the taxpayer, the tax deed purchaser. Now, that, there is an appeal period from that that still runs, but that judgment is, is there. It says who owns the property. Um, it seems to me that if in the 30-day period the, the, the guy, the deed holder, the guy that, owns, that has the property based on the deeds would file an appeal or file a motion to reconsider the order that was that would he then then there would be a dispute, but at this mo point in time, there isn't a dispute. It seems to me. I mean, I'm, is that, am I? I shouldn't be playing. I haven't looked at the OSC. I have a lawyer. I haven't looked at the OSC in record to see what's actually in there, but uh, Ms. Blackburn said that the default judgment was granted in favor of the person who had the uh, the tax deed. So right now. Uh, there would be a default judgment in favor of the person who acquired the property pursuant to the tax deed. And the other guy, if he wants to contest that, is either going to have to file an appeal or he'll have to file a motion in district court to get the judge to set aside the default judgment. Uh, if the default judgment is set aside, then you'd be back in court on who actually owns the property. And that would stop us. Because we wouldn't start for 30 days. If that default judgment was rendered two weeks ago, he's got 30 days, or I believe that's the rule, to file an application for a, for a rehearing or to a motion to set aside. So right. that would have to occur within 30 days from now. And if he did that, then he'd have his own. Then we would be back really locked into a situation where we didn't know who owned it, and we would have a serious problem. But. I, as I understand it, we could actually tear the building down, whether there's a dispute about title or not. The question is not, is not whether there's a dispute about title. The question is whether or not the house is dilapidated. Yeah, the, the, only, the only way the dispute about title plays into it is uh, who has the authority to go on the property to fix it up. That's, I mean, right. as far as us tearing it down, as long as we give notice and opportunity to, heard, to be heard to anyone who has an interest in the property. Which we've done. We can uh, declare it dilapidated and tear it down unless the district court stops us from tearing it down. So I guess the only comment I'd like to make further is that the person that now has title, based on the decision of the judge two weeks ago, is the person that would like to try to restore it. So, But if we keep it on the list, he's got 30 days to yeah. do something about it. That's true. All right. Ready to vote? Uh -huh. The vote is to defer. Right. By rate of vote. All right, cast your votes. And then the vote for the deferral fails. It uh, is three to five. Okay, three six. Can't be three to five. So it's on the, you left it on the list, it's declared dilapidated, so they still have 30 days to take some action before we'd be out there tearing it down. All right. On to item D, this is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. So we need to vote on item 8C2. City clerk is correct. <laughs> okay. Item 8C2 is a resolution to declare the structure uh, dilapidated. Is there a motion there? All right, cast your votes. We're voting on item 8C2, and it passes unanimously. Item 8D is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak, and there any item listed under 8D? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8E is a series of revocable rights of way permits. Item 8E1 is a request by the Farmers Market and Catering to hold the Oklahoma City Farmers Market District Fall Festival. 
Good morning. Are you Bud Scott? Yes, good morning, good morning Council. Bud. Bud Scott, 311 South Klein, on behalf of the Farmers Market District Association. Uh, here before you on a revocable permit for right of way closure, Southwest 2nd Street between South Klein and South Ellison. We've already had uh, staff approval on this and just here to answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you. All right. We have a motion to second. We're voting on item 8E1 and passes unanimously. Thank you. Hope to see you guys down there October 27th. Get a Look free forward to me. it. Good luck. Item 8E2 has already been approved. Item 8E3 is a request by Oklahoma City University to hold the OCU Race with the Stars on November 2nd. And Kerry Perong is here. Kerry? Good morning. Uh, my name is Kerry Perong. I'm the Alumni Director at Oklahoma City University. And this will be our 10th annual, assuming you approve our permit, it will be our 10th annual Marianne Bonetta Race with the Stars on Saturday, November 2nd. And I'd just like to ask that you approve our permit and then come run with us on Saturday, November 2nd. Move for approval. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We're on to item 8F. I understand we do not need an executive session on this item. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8G. I understand we do not need executive session. Do Cast not. Okay. Cast your votes. Yeah. Pass the resolution passes. And item 8H, I understand we do need executive session. Yes, sir. All right. How about a motion then to move that into executive session? Cast your votes. That item moves to executive session. Item 8I is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8I? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 9 is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under item 9? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 10 is items from council. James, you want to get us started? All right, Ed, Larry? Yeah, real quick, I'd just like to, uh, and uh, Councilman Shadid was also in attendance. The Adele Rogers Training Center out on Northwest 23rd in Utah celebrated their 60th anniversary. A very uplifting program, Dale Evans. Uh, got that started uh, 60 years ago because uh, one of their children, Roy and Dale's child, uh, had Down syndrome and that motivated her to get involved. And uh, if you haven't been out there to see what's going on out there, you really ought to. If you want to see some people who are grateful and joyous, you ought to see the uh, clients at the Dale Rogers Training Center in, in operation. And then if you also would like a lesson in what's involved in putting a sidewalk down, uh, you need to come out there because we're putting a new sidewalk on Northwest 23rd Street. And I thought all you had to do with a sidewalk was take a cement spreader and uh, look at the, where you wanted to go and just take off. Uh, it's quite a, quite a project, building sidewalks with what we put in their way. So uh, that work is going on very well. And once it gets in, it, it's a great advantage. I had to walk from Hibden's back home the other day because of a flat tire, and I availed myself of the finished product. and. Uh, if you haven't used one of the new sidewalks, I'd advise you to do it. It's a great experience. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Pete? Uh, this week, uh, I, along with the mayor, I attended the uh, Regional Transit Authority meeting, along with Councilman Shadid. Um, the, the, those meetings are going very well in terms of, uh, of moving forward and, and to, toward a real um, commuter rail system, which uh, uh, is the some of the things I've said previously about other transit activities uh, don't apply to this. This is real transportation, real public transportation, and it's moving very well. A very, very good cross-section of support uh, among the municipalities. Um, there's no, I, I, in fact, this is like the third or fourth meeting I've attended, and I've not heard any, any comments disparaging the idea of moving forward, not, not one. I mean, there's people vary in their degrees of enthusiasm, but the people from Edmond, the people from Norman, people from Midwest City are all very, very interested in moving forward, which I think is very positive. The, the ideas that in the past have always been an RTA, a regional transit authority, would be very difficult to do because you have to get so many municipalities involved. But I think at least from a leadership standpoint, the, the um, the municipalities involved appear to be very much on board. I think the mayor would agree with that, would you, would you not? That uh, mm -hmm. very, there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about routes now. 
there will be a series of meetings held over the next few months where the public will have an opportunity to um, look at the various routes and look at the things that are going on. I think we narrowed it down to three potential routes for each line, that is the line coming from Norman, the line coming from Edmond, and the line coming from Tinker. We've narrowed each of those down to three particular routes. and There will be meetings. In fact, one will be, a down, one will be downtown, but there will be one in each of the locations. And I would encourage each of you to uh, at least attend to see what's going on. The attendance at those meetings has not been what we'd like for it to be, to be honest with you, the public input. Uh, and if we're going to, because eventually it's going to take a vote of the people to do it, and I think now and there's no better time than now to get the public more involved in what we're doing. So if we could, each of us might think about attending one of the meetings at least uh, and talking to other people at neighborhood groups whether we speak to about the possibility of attending those meetings when they come out because they're going to affect uh, the whole city in terms of how it works. So it, uh, it is, I, I would, uh, I would be remiss not to second what uh, Councilman Shadid said about the lack of diversity. And I think all of us share some responsibility in that. Uh, that room is, in fact, striking for its lack of diversity. And uh, I think more effort needs to be made on our part, all of us's part, to uh, see that it, it is more representative of a broader cross-section of the people that live David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I got to attend one of the uh, COPTA meetings last week talking about the new routes, and I want to appreciate, uh, congratulate Rick on his, uh, uh, his management team in making those presentations. I would like to make one comment because uh, it's often said that we don't have a good bus system. Now, that's debatable. But the point I want to make in South Oklahoma City, as far south as Southwest 104th Street, you're within a mile uh, from just about anywhere in Ward 5 anyway to uh, catching a bus because we've got them covering Santa Fe, Walker, Western Penn, and May up to Oklahoma City Community College. So, uh, and then further south, south of the 104th is fairly affluent in South Oklahoma City, so I, I doubt if very many of those uh, citizens actually look to ride the bus, although they're welcome to, and I can, uh, maybe they'll join me to where you could even drive a little bit and pick up the bus from 104th or, or 89th Street. So, I'd want to challenge somebody when they say that, granted, it could be more extensive if we had more money, but it certainly is attempting to, uh, with the constraints that it has to operate in, try to serve as many people as it can. And if you go back to the larger cities back east, it's not unusual to walk a half a mile to get to some form of public transportation. Here in Oklahoma City, we are so used to getting our cars and driving everywhere right up to the front door of wherever we want to go to, that we get a little spoiled. And if, if a bus, for example, isn't going to come out in front of our own house, well, it's not a good system. I don't agree with that. And I just wanted to say that people who share that idea really need to look at it a little bit closer. Uh, again, given the uh, budget that they're having to work in, I think this new design, at least focusing on Ward 5, is as good of coverage as we could hope for. And the fact that somebody has to walk, and I understand people with disabilities are in a different situation. I, I understand I wish we could do something better. But those just uh, without disabilities, uh, to have to walk a half a mile a mile, uh, I think it's really helpful to them in the long run. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Meg? Yeah, Mayor, just a couple of things. Um, I have the privilege of serving on the governance subcommittee for the regional transit dialogue, and I would echo Pete's comments that I really think there is a lot of strong momentum on the part of regional leadership to have this discussion and to move forward. And um, the subcommittee is working really diligently um, to try to put in place 
you know, look at best practices around the country and talk to other cities that have put together regional transit authorities and work on what that might look like here. And I just wanted to particularly thank ACOG and their staff. They're doing a really good job providing the background material for us to begin to develop a framework for the Oklahoma City region. Um, and with regard to the bus transit, I'd really like to thank Debbie Martin. She attended both meetings that were downtown at the library um, as my surrogate provided great feedback. And Rick, I heard your staff did an excellent job. And um, you know, we had some folks that are concerned about the route changes, but um, the, the uh, information I saw was that most of those issues were addressed. And change is going to be difficult, but change is important as we move forward to a better all-around structure and more timely system. So thank you to your staff, and thank you, Debbie. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, last week, I did have the opportunity to attend uh, two of COPTA's meeting at the Ralph Ellison Library. Um, both uh, meetings um, were well, very well attended. Um, matter of fact, they had to add another date, which will be tomorrow uh, at 11.45 a.m. at Ralph Ellison uh, Library. And I do believe uh, Rick and his staff did an excellent job. Uh, and uh, also there were a couple of concerns that I think we'll be able to uh, get uh, addressed. Uh, as many of you saw that on last week I had on the bow tie. Um, the story behind the bow tie, the fabric was actually designed by our own uh, James Griner uh, from Hobby Lobby. <laughs> so I did want to recognize him for the design of the fabric uh, that came from uh, Hobby, Hobby Lobby. Um, as it relates to the regional transit uh, system, I think regional transit uh, system would, be, would do great uh, for our city, not only for our city, but for also our state. And diversity is uh, something that we do uh, need to um, work on. So, again, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Pat? Your Honor, just a couple questions. The, to the people who went to the, the transportation meeting and talked about how enthusiastic these other people were, did their enthusiasm go so far as to suggest that they would be willing to tax themselves to help pay for that system? But they understand that, because I think it's terribly unfair to ask the citizens of Oklahoma City to subsidize a transportation method that takes money, tax money out of the city and versus someplace else. Second question I have is on electronic bidding. Have we implemented that system fully, completely yet? Say that again, Mr. Ryan. Have we implemented electronic bidding on all our systems so far? Uh, this morning is actually the first electronic bidding for a procurement item. Uh, and as of yesterday, there were four uh, bids submitted, and they were opening those, or they will open them at 10 o'clock. The construction projects will not start uh, until the November 5th meeting. Uh, that's when we will release the first construction projects and open them on November 26th. Well, I have a constituent who was concerned that the electronic bidding would open the construction project, get more out of state bidders, and allow uh, them to compete with our own local contractors. He felt this was a, a, not a desirable situation. Will we ha or do we anticipate more bidding from out of the state? Well, on construction items, you're still required to be pre-qualified with the city. Uh, you know, we currently have some out-of-state bidders, but they have to be pre-qualified with the city before we will award them a contract. So we just couldn't have an out outside contractor just at random come in and bid. We'd have to be pre-qualified to do that kind of work. Exactly. Two, two parameters there. We do have the pre qual requirements, that, which does require a presence in the metro area, not in Oklahoma City necessarily, but in the metro area. But secondly, we can't limit too many things because of the Oklahoma competitive bidding. And, and our own charter actually has some very open bidding because of the, the concept is we want as many people involved to get the cheapest price. But we do have uh, some things that encourage the local participation based upon our pre qual bidding. Um, we get very few outside contractors that bid on our projects, and I don't see that changing because of this going to electronic bidding. Well, I'll, I'll re reassure my constituent that we, we're not putting our local contractors at a severe disadvantage by opening up the bidding process. If, if I may just follow up on Pat's comments, and I understand we're always trying to get the least expensive price for whatever we're trying to purchase as a city, and I think that's good. Uh, I have been told that there are some municipalities that have 
within the limitations that the state places on municipalities provided some method to to give a preference to local vendors in some situations and I'm not quite sure certainly not uh, well enough informed to explain it in any depth all I'm suggesting is if those groups do ever come forward that we're uh, receptive to their proposals and at least give them a fair look uh, and I know we will uh, just to if there is some way to give local vendors a preference and still be able to get a competitive price I think that's what our goal should be actually our local contractors are very um, broad thinkers in that area and come to us somewhat regularly with some concepts that they, they would like to see us implement and uh, we try to work with them on that and some of the things we they bring forth we, we do bring forth the council change change some things from time to time um, a lot of the things they bring forth we're not able to implement either because of the charter or because of the just the, the state competitive bidding act if you're talking about uh, public construction contracts you would need a change in state law that would authorize that and also a change in the city charter and if you're talking about uh, just procurement items we would really would need a change in the city charter to do that but we do work with them with some of our general conditions that we put into our contracts uh, our pre-qualification requirements and those type of things we do work with the local community yeah and councilman on uh, procurement items uh, the delivery time is very important uh, we're required to take the lowest and best bid and, and we can use delivery time for best bid thank, thank you but I can point out the cheapest is not always the least cost so we just need that in mind. All right, city manager reports. Thank you. We have several this morning. I'd like to start out uh, with Mr. Ruben Aragon from the Latino Community Development Agency to update us on his organization's uh, scope of work and some of the achievements they've had recently. Thank you for coming down this morning. Thank you very much. I'm Ruben Aragon, the president and CEO of Latino Community Development Agency. Uh, I'd like to address two things. I uh, would like to address the strong economic importance of Latinos in Oklahoma and, and have they become a very solid engine of economic growth for, as well as how the Latino agency is serving Oklahoma. And now Ed Shadid early mentioned that Latinos are now 18 percent of Oklahoma City's population. Latino population is doubling every 10 years. Over 60 percent of Oklahoma City schools. And people hear these shocking statistics and sometimes that what's happening. And but I think a question to ask is what would happen if Latinos were not growing that fast. In 2000, Oklahoma wasn't growing. We lost, after the 2000 census, one congressional district. In 2010, Oklahoma again kept up with the rest of the growth. However, if you look at that growth, the majority of the growth in Oklahoma was the Latino growth. Without the Latino growth, Oklahoma would have lagged again as in jeopardy of losing yet another congressional district. Latinos have become a very powerful part of Oklahoma. And Oklahoma has a lot to offer. We all know that. Uh, uh, Oklahoma is family-based, faith-based. These Oklahoma values are also Latino values. But the main reason Latinos come to Oklahoma is work. They are strongly work-oriented, and they follow the work. When Kelly Air Force Base closed in San Antonio and the work was moved up to Tinker, it was the Latinos primarily that came and followed the work. They come where the work is. When states like California that have a lot of Latinos are now seeing high unemployment, Latinos are moving from California to Oklahoma, kind of a reverse dust bowl. And, and again, Latinos follow the work. You've seen that work ethic. We have hailstorms. We know who fixes the roofs. And there's a difference now. Before the arrival of a Latino worker, those roofs just take three days to finish. Gary England can be saying it's 100 degrees out there. They're up there fixing that roof, and they get it done in one day. The productivity is unmatched. Tremend that productivity has been noticed in the oil field, and, the, and many companies are, very, are, are, are hiring Latinos at a tremendous rate. Some big companies have been built in Oklahoma. Total Environment is, is, is primary Latino workforce. Salazar Roofing is now multi-state, has been built on a Latino workforce. Now, there had been a period, when you see these shocking numbers, normal, natural, there's been some pe people trying to suppress that growth. There were laws like 1804 that were passed. But many, many companies are now looking, no longer looking to suppress it. In fact, they're embracing the tremendous growth as a great opportunity. 
Banks and credit unions are building their branches in the Latino area of town because they want those deposits. Latino businesses have grown all over the south part of town and sales taxes receipts are gone up because all this work produces money and the purchasing power has gone very strong. Stores like Buy for Less changed their entire business concept as far as the, you look at the stores in, in Edmond, you look at the stores in, in Norman, they're very different than the ones for, for in Latino areas. They target Latinos. They have big carcasses of beef hanging in the beef shop in, in the butcher area. Uh, they have to fresh tortilla machines making tortillas because Latinos have lots of family activities. They want it fresh. They give the concept of freshness. A lot of this is just for show, but the bottom line is those cash registers are ringing at a tremendous rate and sales tax are up in that area. Many others are copying and going after that market. We had a collapsed mall, Crossroads Mall. New money has come in from out of state into Oklahoma. New merchants have come in because that mall has been resurrected as Plaza Mayor, targeted directly at Latino, the Latino uh, purchasing power. There's no question Latinos have become a very solid engine of economic growth for Oklahoma and Oklahoma City. Now with that growth, there's lots of other challenges and lots of needs. Many of these employers that employ Latinos do not have employer health, health insurance. With no employer-funded health insurance, uh, Latinos, 39% have no insurance at all. No insurance, no preventive care. No preventive care, no mammograms. But here in Oklahoma, Latinos have the Latino Community Development Agency. One of our programs is a breast cancer program that's one of the most successful programs in the state. We have health promoter model where we go out, we go, go to churches, we, we have outreach, we reach these Latino women, we arrange with partners in Oklahoma to get them the mammograms. If there's a problem and the mammogram shows the problem that, and we have subsequent biopsy that shows they have cancer, we shift from a health promoter model into a nav full navigator model, getting that woman the best care possible, staying with her every step of the way, LCDA, is there for her family, is there for her, is there for the community. There's a front page article in the Sunday Oklahoman covering the success of this program. Everywhere in the country, except Oklahoma City, everywhere in the country, the survival rate for Latino women from breast cancer is at the lowest level. But here in Oklahoma City, the survival rate for Latino women is the highest level, as high as what Caucasian women, as high as Asian American women, Latino women in Oklahoma City, thanks to the LCDA, have the same high survival rate as people, as women living in Gloria. And that's just one of 24 programs we have. We have 24 programs because we're, we're basically the Latino agency in Oklahoma. There is nobody else like us, and we're pretty much a monopoly of services. Among our 24 programs, we immunize. Uh, we have uh, uh, nutrition classes. We have exercise classes. We do HIV testing. We have programs uh, for crisis intervention for women that are victims of domestic violence. We help kids that, are, that, that have gone through trauma. Uh, we, we have substance abuse programs. We have tobacco cessation programs. We have the largest staff of licensed bilingual mental health therapists in the state of Oklahoma. The criminal justice system here in Oklahoma sends us problem kids, gang members, other kids that have had problems in school, come for counseling, and our results have been incredible, but they come as an alternate to very, very costly incarceration. But we don't just work with the problem kids. We're making sure we do the human capital development to create the superstars of the future. We have the highest rated bilingual early childhood infant toddler program in the state. We take kids at six, six weeks old by three and a half years old. They're totally fluent in English and Spanish at a vocabulary level much higher than their age group. These will be the valedictorians of the future class. We have, we have programs for, for young kids. We have uh, Latino clubs working through the schools. We, have, we work through OSU partnership to have 4-H clubs. We also have major programs based on merit. It's merit and need for scholarships, but we, have, for, we want to find the superstars of the future. And we have leadership training. Some of you were at our, at our, at our annual luncheon. Here's a young man. He came to this country. His mom brought him at 14 years old didn't speak much English at all. He's gone through our programs. He's gone through our leadership training. Four years later, at 18 years old, he's standing in front of 700 people at the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, making an address in very fluent English, passioned, 
thanking the Latino agency for what we do for them. We're creating the, the superstars of the future. We operate out of a, 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 an old building, the river, used to be Riverside Elementary School. I'd invite everybody to come and see what we do there. Hopefully you get the feeling I get. Because when I see the work we do, the dedication of our staff, every time I walk into that old building, I know I'm walking into a sacred place. We save lives, we enrich lives, we empower people. Last year alone, we made 114,000 service touches to 44,000 unduplicated clients. We have a tremendous track record that allows us to get the grants and funding for this. There was recently a, a, a very large grant being offered for home visitation, something we've done for 20 years, that we've created the evidence-based track record, that's going to, that we're, we're counselors that go to, to the homes, make sure, and some of these young mothers are 15, 16 years old. They don't know how to be a mother yet. But we make sure the kids are not subject to any abuse, any maltreatment, and, and even neglect is a huge part of abuse. So we make sure that's covered. And we teach them to be the, the first teachers of their kids. The program works, and these kids that go through that program do very, very well. Now this grant, and big grants are common nowadays. This is a time of sequester. This is a time of government cutbacks. Heck, it's even a time of government shutdown now. So when a very large grant came up, most nonprofits in the state, many of whom are floundering right now with funding, all wanted this grant. Not only the nonprofits, the Oklahoma City Schools decided they wanted too. Every school district in Oklahoma, including the Oklahoma City School District, the Bethany School District, bid against us. But nobody could match our track record. And when the award was given, Latino Community Agency was awarded $500,000 annually on a multi-year contract. Our, our award is greater than, it was almost as great as all the rest of the awards combined. We have a track record, we deliver. We have a very dedicated staff, a passion to serve, so we embrace this new era of growth and we will continue with human capital development as, as the Latino community has become a very powerful engine of economic growth for all of Oklahoma. And I'm very thankful that I get to tell our story. I really invite you to come and visit us. We have, we're outgrowing our facility. We may at some point ask for, for help in, in trying to expand that, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I see several people have heard some of this before in our luncheon. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Now, we're very proud of the accomplishments of the LCDA. Thank you for your work down there. And I'm sure there are some console comments. Ed, a couple. Uh, first of all, I just I want to thank you for your, your dedication and your work. I think your, your revenue has increased 40 percent. That's great. Uh, most uh, nonprofits are down quite a bit. They're suffering with funding. Our revenues and our budget next year will be 40 percent greater than it was just a year ago. We are growing. We have to grow. The community is growing. But we're going even faster in the community because we have to offer a lot of programs. So we're doing exceptionally well and we're going after new areas. We want to expand in horizontally and do lots of other new areas as well as we have big wait lists. We have to grow more. But we, our, our revenues, while other nonprofits are, are, are in a bit of trouble, we are, our, our growth is surged and we continue to surge. Well, I, I think part of that has to do with the track record of LCDA, but you don't increase 40% without someone like you in leadership. And so I, I applaud your efforts. Can, can you talk about maybe the land across the street in the park and maybe some ideas about what? That's, that's we're, we're off of Southwest 10th Street. We have the old Riverside building. The city owns land right across the street. That's part of a park, but it's really the fringes of a park and there's a lot of other park area there. It's kind of the park that becomes one of the cheapest alternatives on, on what to do with that land. We can do a lot with it. We can do a lot for Oklahoma City. We, we'd like to target more youth programs. We can build soccer fields that we can maintain, other, other programs, because while Latinos have grown tremendous rate, there's, there are gang problems. There are a lot of problems that we'd like to address. We have other programs. We have the track record to do this. So we would very much be interested in having the land across the street, because that's, that, that's part, of, part of the park. And I think we can do, in terms of highest and best use, we can do a lot for Oklahoma. We have done a lot for Oklahoma. Uh, we get most of our funding from grants. When we get federal grants, that's money that comes into Oklahoma. And we can get, we have the track record to do it, and we can, while the Latino community has been, been an engine of economic growth, LCDA itself has become an engine of economic growth for the community. So we are very interested in that property. We would like 
at some point to make a concrete proposal to show you what we can do with it and see if there's some interest. The city has no cost in that. That was given to the city by the Department of Transportation. And we think we can do a lot more for the city with that property, so we'd be very, very interested in it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Just a quick question. Ruben, one of the things um, I've learned about most recently is the work that you're doing in the area of domestic violence. And yes. really appreciate that. Um, it's a difficult subject. Um, and I know you're moving forward um, with some partnerships uh, with the YWCA and right. moving toward providing some housing. Can you talk just a little bit about yeah. some of this area? And, and I think the point you brought up, a lot of the work we do, we, could, we couldn't do a lot of work without leveraging commu with uh, community partners. Just for example, the, the, in the, in the uh, breast cancer program that's been so successful, we have partnerships with Mercy Hospital. We have partnerships with Mary Mahoney. We have partnerships. We don't give them mammograms. We arrange for them to be done. Uh, in domestic violence, we're the bilingual source. They refer, YMCA refers clients to us. We do the crisis intervention, but we don't have shelters. They have that, and we have to follow up. We also, in domestic violence, not only, not, we're one of the few that not only tries to help the women, but we try to rehabilitate the men. Now there, there's a different, we can't get funding for that, but they have to pay for it themselves. I mean, they, they pay $25 a session for a 52-week course. If they miss, they have a choice. Uh, they can come to our course and get rehabilitated and go through a 52-week course, or they can go to jail. So they come to our course, but we make sure they come out and do well. Not 100% success, but, but we've had lots of people that do, do very well. But that domestic violence, it shocks me to see how many women come in every day. And when they come in, they're battered. They come in with their kids. They're terrified. They're scared to go to any place else because some of the problems with, with 1804 and some of these other laws, so they have no place else to go. So almost we get them in where it's come to us or die type situation. So it's a very – we help them with counseling. We help them with crisis innovation. We place, place them in, in places to stay. We help them get restraining orders. Uh, and, and help their kids who've gone through the trauma. We have counseling. I say we have the largest staff of licensed bilingual mental health therapists in all of Oklahoma, the entire state. And we, we're uniquely qualified to help them. And, and that's just, again, one of 24 programs. Thank you so much. I, just, I hadn't really focused on that particular issue within the climate of 1804 and, and how severe it was. And I appreciate everything you're doing in that area. Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to address you, so thank you very much. Uh, yes, yes, just a couple of comments. One, I'm looking forward to Plaza Mayor being uh, further along. I know FEMA's taken most of the uh, facilities uh, currently out there, but uh, I think once the developers can really move forward with their project out there, it's going to be a great asset to South Oklahoma City, and we're re really looking forward to it. I would suggest that there's an opportunity to work with especially certain members of the council like Councilman White uh, in Ward 4, Councilman, Councilwoman Salyer uh, in Ward 6, and myself in Ward 5 to try to work together with the LCDA uh, and other partners to help uh, develop a more, a better line of communication with the Latinos in South Oklahoma City, especially, but throughout Oklahoma City. And I'm just encouraging you to try to uh, consider working with us in that regard. And certainly there's, uh, there's just a variety of issues we could, I think, uh, provide some guidance in and uh, just wanted to extend that. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and again, we could not do a lot of this without extending partnerships, so we're very open to working with everybody. And by the way, uh, uh, when we talk about this, every one of our programs is open to absolutely everybody. Uh, uh, we're in the Latino area town. If you call, they'll answer in Spanish. If you look at the signs outside, they'll answer in Spanish. So, and we, most of the referrals come from Latinos. So naturally, the, the bulk of the people that come there are Latinos. But we have African Americans, Native Americans. Uh, one program we have, uh, the way this program started, we had a troubled kid that was referred to us by the criminal justice system. A real mess, involved in drugs, involved in, in gang violence, got thrown out of school naturally. He comes to the Latino Agency for counseling. For the first time ever, he sees somebody that looks like him, that's bilingual, bicultural, can relate to him, and he buys in. Not everybody buys in, but he did. This kid that had 
terrible attendance in school, has absolutely perfect attendance to all his counseling services, brought his parents in, they have perfect attendance too. And she's able to get him back in school. This kid ends up being a pretty smart kid. He gets A's and B's in school. This kid had never seen a C. So he's doing quite well, but then he points out something. He made mistakes, he wants to turn his life around, but he's got gang tattoos all over his neck, he's got teardrops tattooed to his eye, he's got gang tattoos. He says, nobody's gonna hire me, and he's right. Our mission is not complete until we make sure that everybody can be self-reliant, and if we just counseled him and got him back to school, our mission would not be complete. So we, he inspired us to set up another program. We had a tattoo removal program. And uh, we removed his tattoos, he didn't go out to college, he went through Metrotech, he's now doing air conditioning and heating, he's self-supporting. Without us, he would have been a mess. Probably dead, may kill somebody, maybe even a mass murder, who knows. But we, we turned him around. But in that tattoo removal program, that's one of our programs, that we do not have 90% Latinos. We have about 60% Latinos. Anybody under 18, it's absolutely free. We had an Aryan gang member who had a swastika on his neck. Who's gonna hire him with a swastika on his neck? And he came in, we took that tattoo off. So our programs are open to absolutely everybody. Uh, but as, as in the area in and with our name and everything, naturally Latinos go, every one of our programs is absolutely open to everybody. Thank you so much for coming down. Mayor, well, I, huh? I have a comment about the suggestion about the park. Uh, you're talking about across the street north yes. from, from Riverside? North from Riverside, yes. You know, it seems south of I-40. Now would be a perfect time to make a proposal about that. Okay. Uh, the. Um, the, the south part, the park is a long ways off from a map, from being done in maps. You could really be the the catalyst for things that go on south of the south of the interstate. It seems to me um, that that we you know we've had this watercolor about those that park area being soccer fields and so forth. Uh, I think now would be a perfect time to do it. Well, we're very interested. We need, we're, we're busting the seams for growth. I would think you'd also at the same time look at um, some kind of a, a expansion and rehabilitation of the, of the school building itself. It seems to me it's anchored right in the center of what was, is the historic Latino community in Oklahoma City. And to, to re be able to renovate that building and maybe move the street a little bit to the south where you could use that beautiful front entrance again instead of coming in the back. I think there are lots of ideas that, to, that could be utilized right now to move that forward. Well, we'd be very interested in, in, in putting a quality proposal, and I think we, we could show that the highest and best use for that land, given, the, you know, given our track record and given uh, the growing needs for the Latino community, and, 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 and the growing problems. I mean, uh, we do great counseling with kids. It's sometimes discouraging to see after all the great counseling, they get back with their friends and, they, they, and, and end up getting back influenced. We'd like to have other activities for them, tie their time up, bring them some leadership training. And you know, these are one out of every five children born in Oklahoma City is now Latino. We have a huge number that are in our schools. These, this is the future workforce. We want to do everything for human capital development to make sure they're very strong and continue to be a strong part of Oklahoma City. And we're in a unique position to do that, so I'm very, very encouraged with the receptivity of this idea. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Okay, thank we you We appreciate much. the work. All right, item uh, B out of the city manager reports is on bus shelters. Right, we do have a report on bus shelters. It shows some proposed uh, locations on it, a proposed concept on the bus shelters, uh, and Rick's here to talk about our plan. Obviously, bus shelters has been, uh, our intent to put bus shelters in is contingent upon going forward with the Nelson Nygar study. That's going forward at this point in time. As we get down the line and decide where the routes are going to be, we can go forward then and where our recommendations are as to the best uh, locations for the bus shelters. Thank you. Uh, Rick Kane, Director of Public Transportation and Parking and Administrator of the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority. Um, this item is really just another element uh, in what we're working to try to improve our public transportation system. I think back to, uh, you know, it was a few months ago when you took a step when we actually did an amendment to the uh, city ordinance regarding street furniture, and that was really phase one in moving forward in this process to try to provide better amenities for our bus passengers. As we've been going through the, the Nelson Nygaard study, and I, I want to thank those of you who made kind comments about staff's efforts in the public meeting process, I do want to comment that we have received tremendous comments. Um, 
We will be, we still have one more meeting, as Councilman Pettis indicated, that's going to be tomorrow at the Ralph Ellison Library. Uh, we will, all, we've also been soliciting comments through the uh, website, and also we have an open phone line where people can call in and make comments to us. We're also taking uh, comments by mail as well. So we've received a number of comments. I think there's been some good things that have been pointed out to us, particularly access to certain shopping centers that present problems for folks who, who may have some type of a mobility issue. Um, certainly being sensitive to those who have some type of a a disability that they've called to our attention that it makes it difficult to m move in the city sidewalks being one of the big ones that has come out in, in a number of our meetings um, relative to the street furniture ordinance uh, and, and specifically bus shelters staff has taken a look in light of the Nelson Nygaard study that that is going on the recommendations that have come out of that and then staff modifications to those we went through and identified 31 different locations where we felt that it could use shelters based on the current service standards that the COPPA board has adopted. Uh, these service standards relate to uh, fairness and equity in, in terms of where shelters are placed throughout the city. Um, probably our biggest problem in, those, in identifying those 31 shelters is the fact that only six of them have sidewalk access. And again, that was an item that has been brought up almost in every public meeting that we've had is that we that we need to address sidewalk access as part of our overall program. Um, I, we have shared with each of you a shelter design. That's going to be considered by the COPPA Board of Trustees to adopt a design for our bus shelters. Um, also, from the standpoint included in your report was a, a, a recommend, or a, not a recommendation, but rather uh, an announcement that we do have about $200,000 of federal funding it's actually, we contained it uh, in four of our grants. Uh, we have a line item in there for bus shelters. Um, that is a capital expense that does qualify for federal reimbursement on an 80% federal share, 20% local share match that we have. Um, I think the other element to, to consider here is we have been working with Tyler Media. They are our contractor in terms of bus shelters, providing bus shelters. They have the majority of shelters that are out there right now. Uh, we're talking to them in terms of um, they're providing shelters or COPPA owning shelters and they're providing perhaps the maintenance to those shelters. Maintenance of shelters is going to be a big issue. Uh, we, we either have to address it as a staff addition or, or contract that service out. We're also talking to Tyler about revenue sharing. Depending upon who owns the shelters, it can make a difference in terms of the rev revenue sharing opportunity. So, um, you know, th this is still a work in process in, in, in that vein and trying to work with our existing contractor in that effort. Rick, you want to point out that although we've got uh, basically $212,000 to pursue in this area, you pointed out in, in your report that some there are challenges regarding access with, with sidewalks and such. And in your attachment, you pointed out which areas do have sidewalk access and which areas do not have sidewalk access. And what we're trying to do so that we can get some handle around the number of what would it take to do sidewalks, we've actually got staff out there measuring linear foot or distances, and then we'll work with public works on a price per linear foot just so that we can put a rough estimate together in terms of what would it cost in, in sidewalk uh, to, to come up with funding to, to provide the appropriate sidewalk. I will, I will say that we are working in partnership with the city relative to geo bond projects that are out there. We're also sensitive to the sidewalk locations that they're doing in maps. And most recently, we actually brought some federal money to the table uh, to provide sidewalk money to make, and again, worked with the city ADA funding that was available through General Services and Paula Falkenstein uh, to put together sidewalks. You see some down on the south side, down by 74th and, and uh, um, uh, Santa Fe, and then also along 23rd Street, close to Penn's, uh, on Penn and 23rd. Those are all new projects that have been both a partnership between the city and COTPA. Rick, just to see if I can set the ends of, of, of where we're going at this point in time. There's a scenario where we could build the, the 21 or 22 bus shelters out there for 12,000 apiece, and the city would pay for for that, or COPTA would pay for that through the federal grants. COPTA would pay for it. At that point in time, Tyler would maintain those bus benches, sell the advertising, and we would get a greater return on those bus benches, but then there's no resources for sidewalks. Correct. The other scenario would be where Tyler comes in, builds all 22 of those, or maybe some beyond that, and 
pays for the maintenance and pays for the cost of the, the shelters and provides the advertising on that, we would get a, a, a much less return on those bus shelters at that point in time, and then we could we could use that money then to address all the access issues out out there. The reality is we're probably going to be somewhere between those two boundaries that, I, that, I, that I've said. We know we're going to have to take some money for some access issues out there. We don't know how much. Is that is that? Those is are that all correct statements. Okay. That's right. Th that basically answered my question, I think, which was, you know, if we were to have a contractor, and we do have one, that would build the shelters, are those federal dollars available to provide sidewalks? and better access to those new shelters? They can be. Essentially what happens is I make, a, I make a grant request to the FTA to make modifications, and generally they've been very supportive of any requests that I've made in that regard. So we would reallocate th those funds to something else. And that would be an 80-20 match? Yes. 80% federal money, 20 city funds? Yes. In order to? Well, local funds. Local funds in order to do sidewalks. Thank you, Rick. I think it's important if we could use that money to put sidewalks access. It's, I think the sidewalk access is almost as important as the bus shelter themselves. Because we've got to have a way to get, for people to get there conveniently. Yeah. And so if we let Tyler or whoever it was build all the shelters and then devote most of that money then we have to access, I think we'd be well ahead of the game. I understand right. that it, point, but obviously one of our goals has been to get more revenue into COP, and one of the ways to get more money into COP is, is to maximize our our, our potential revenue off, off the advertising, and one way to do that is to minimize the capital investment. So it's a trade-off. But I think total, we need to look at total cost. Yeah, totally. Agree. Rather than try to, to isolate this is a revenue source, how much is that revenue source going to cost us, which I think is important to identify and understand. But then I think we can go forward and use this, this matching money we have with the federals to provide access, and I think that's really important. If we build shelters, we have to have good access. Well, I think it is important to reemphasize the fact that in the street furniture ordinance, we very specifically said we're not going to put shelters up unless we have ADA access to those shelters. So we've got enough problems across the city right now where we don't have good access to them. We don't want to perpetuate that. So that is a requirement within the ordinance itself that we do that. But I, I, think, I think the good news is that we're identifying the areas that are most, according to Mr. Kane, needing shelters. And we're, we're going forth to, to at least, at a minimum, do what we've laid out here today with the opportunity to go beyond that um, as we go forward. How aggressive is the construction plan, Rick? If, if we use the grant money, how fast could you build these shelters? Well, I, I think the, the building of the shelters could happen fairly quickly. Um, I just, in answer to your question, will be, will be uh, what will delay us potentially is the sidewalk access right. issue, and I just don't have a good grasp of what that dollar number is yet. How would we resolve that, Jim? If, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it as we don't want to be waiting on the sidewalks and have the money to build the. We're evaluating each of those sites right now. Okay. Uh, are we, are the one that's uh, that one that I've seen you already kind of have begun is the one there on um, the one I complain about all the time, right. on Walker. I mean, on the Santa Fe. Um, it looks to me that what what the, what we're doing there is building ADA access to the shelter, so that somebody comes to the shelter, they can get on the they can get to the shelter from the, not building a sidewalk, a whole sidewalk, but building just enough uh, a sidewalk to where you could access it. Yeah, we worked with the legal department to make sure we understood, and, and working with the general services again and the and from the standpoint of the city's ADA office to make sure that we know just exactly how far we have to go. When we are sitting in front of a, a large store, like let's use Walmart as an right. example, you know, our obligation is we have to at least connect to the driveways. Now that assumes that somebody has access either through the parking lot or, you know, comes from the side, uh, and, and that is our requirement. We, you know, we don't have the wherewithal to take it to full length of 74th, but we are making sure that whatever we do at least meets the minimum standards in terms of what we're required. But those are some of the challenges that we have. There are certain areas of the city where there aren't any other connectors, and we're talking about long segments of sidewalk that would have to be built, and that's what costs us so much. Well, I've looked at the ones that, that are set out in, in my ward, and all of those are accessible uh, without building a long sidewalk. You can build something that connects it to a driveway so that if somebody came to that point, they would be able to get off the bus and get on to, and the same thing with somebody getting on, too. So, so in part, Mayor, to your, to your question to us, this is one way that we would be perhaps having to establish priorities is 
those that would that we where we have the funds to be able to do more it's our desire to do as many as we can so that sack that sidewalk access issue could become a big one in terms of how quickly we move forward mm -hmm. yeah, that's my concern is you're not building sidewalks and you're ready to build the bus shelters and we're not we don't have the sidewalks there to, to, to accommodate the timing right that's what that's what we're evaluating we're going to find those and we're going to I think there's probably some low-hanging fruit that we'll go after to start with, and then as it, they'll become more difficult as we go on down the line. Okay. See, so Rick, you identified for me 15 locations in Ward 2, and some of which are included on that list and some of which are not. Right. Can it, and essentially what we did, you recall the last council meeting at the end of that meeting, you talked about looking at, at, at shelters from the standpoint of greatest need as opposed to necessarily just where, you know, within a, a ward location. So what we did here was just said, okay, if we're going to open that up citywide, you know, wh where, where would we go first? And this would be the first ones we would, we would go after. Now, one of the other issues that we would need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, in speaking to the 15 shelters that we gave you in, in Ward 2, and we did that for a number of other council people that also ask us to identify shelters. Um, which may or may not all be on this list, um, is that one of the other op options that we're considering right now from a staff perspective is to take to our board is to expand our service standard definition of what qualifies as a shelter location. We're trying to be very careful that we follow the Federal Transit Administration guidelines because we don't want to get into Title VI issues on something like this. And so we are looking to expand. There was a time when basically the only place we would locate a shelter is where we either had high population in terms of ridership or we had a lot of buses going by. But there have been some softening from a federal perspective in regards to how that's addressed. And now we have the options also to look at senior centers and to look at, at uh, areas where there may be a high disability usage of the shelter. And those now qualify. And so those kinds of changes that are taking place from a federal level, or now we want to make sure we incorporate those in our service standards, which we're required to adopt as part of our FTA uh, oversight process. And so the COPPA board will be assessing that as well. So the, now for the, say the 2007 bond street projects where we're building sidewalks, if we have, we're building sidewalks on a street that has a transit route, and especially if it had one of these on it, could we not use unlisted bond funds to add the $10,000 to the sidewalk to put a bus shelter in at the same time? I don't know the answer to that. For, to use unlisted bond funds. <laughs> Good timing. Uh, to, 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 do bond shelter, uh, to do bus shelters. Now you're, are you talking about the sidewalks or for the bus shelters themselves? Well, the, the bond has the, I mean, the sidewalk is part of the bond project. So you're saying, can we use unlisted? Can you add bus shelters, you know, to unlisted, the... Unlisted street project money for bus shelters. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. That's a good question, but I just don't know the answer. Okay. Yeah, I think what we have been successful in doing, though, is in those places where we've identified street work is being done and therefore sidewalk is being done, we actually did use some of our... We had several hundred thousand dollars dedicated to sidewalk money, and so we made that connection from the sidewalk to the bus stop. So I just want to, just to reiterate, that the cost to add evening bus service would be about one to one and a half million dollars a year. Yeah, based on a proposal that was presented by Nelson Nygaard, uh, it was, and that only went to 9.30 at night, it was a million two. And Sunday bus service is? A million and a half. Right. And Sunday bus service basically matches our Saturday service. So I, I'm having trouble, just from a business perspective, understanding any conclusion, I mean, the sidewalk issue aside, how it would make business sense whatsoever for any arrangement, if you have the capital dollars, especially if 80% are federal in some cases, why you wouldn't invest the capital and get a, a much higher uh, share of the advertising revenue, which then gives you a dedicated funding source. It, it pays for itself. It, the money we pay for the bus shelter, we get back through a, <clears throat> right now, <clears throat> excuse me, right now we get zero. So it's only, it's only up from here. But if you had something like a 50-50 split, 
<clears throat> how you don't get your investment back. And then you have a dedicated funding source from there on out. Pay for the maintenance and whatever's left over, you apply towards evening bus service. I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding, and, and I know people from this council have expressed the same uh, question as far back as in the 1980s. Why we have this advertising arrangement? Well, why, if you, if you have the capital dollars, why you wouldn't put the capital outlay and then get your money back? It, it doesn't make sense from a business perspective any other way. I mean, if, I'm, I'm open to somebody explaining to me uh, how it makes sense, but it just doesn't to me. Councilman Shadi, I, I, you know, conceptually you're absolutely right, I believe. But what we need to do is actually put the numbers together and, and identify how much revenue could be achieved and, and then what is the, or what are the capital costs that we would incur and whether or not those funds are available. Um, at, at so far, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying so far we've just talked in generalities and conceptual ideas and unless we actually see the numbers put down on paper, it's hard for anybody to agree or disagree. Sure, I mean, and David, we've, we've, we've done that. We asked for an audit. Of, of Tyler Media's revenue. We had a gentleman here during the street furniture ordinance who indicated that he got about $300 a month from his bus benches. Uh, so it was at $3,600 a year. It's a $10,000 capital outlay. If there were situations where you're capturing 50%, $1,800 a year. Uh, I'm, I mean, those are real numbers. And you can talk to Rick about what he found in his audit. But I think we have some data. Yeah, and all I'm saying is we just need to see it, you know, work those numbers out. Okay. I mean, that's all from an accountant's because perspective. Because the other side of the business model is if you've got somebody that's willing to make the capital investment for you, and we have the opportunity to leverage those dollars and use them for sidewalks and other investments, that it makes sense. Um, you know, I don't see building bus shelters as necessarily a core part of the city's business. And when we talked about it earlier, we did discuss that we had an advertising person on staff selling advertising and we've got to have maintenance folks. I mean, there was a lot more cost associated with that capital investment that's ongoing rather than just building the bus shelter. So I agree with David that I think looking at those numbers pretty hard makes a lot of sense before we jump off and change the model that's been successful for us. And so just one point, uh, we've just seen it in the private industry that uh, you have uh, people enter into a, a particular industry just because one entity is having success and they try to duplicate that success and sometimes they're just not successful you know they don't have the right personnel and from a marketing uh, perspective or a variety of issues maybe administrative so just because one entity is having success the company that's operating these uh, or constructing these bus stops and selling the advertising doesn't necessarily mean that the city would have the same level of success. But David, we're not necessarily talking about the city getting into the advertising business. The excuse that's been used against us for them keeping 100% of the revenue is that they, they put out these 40-year-old uh, bus benches with uneven, you know, two by fours on them. Right. And that because they put out the capital outlays, they should keep 100% of the revenue. I think all the argument is just, okay, we'll put out the capital outlay. We'll put out the money for the ten for the $10,000 for the capital. And then you continue to do the advertising, but let's have a more, a, a split that's more in line with all the other big league cities in the in America. Yeah. And then have a dedicated funding source for things like evening bus service. But, but uh, Councilman Shadid, I don't think uh, Councilman Green is arguing with you. He just wants to see the numbers. Some yeah. kind of analysis or right. paper that shows. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I think it's time to move beyond just the conceptual discussion and actually put a model together and see what it would provide for us. Great. How, how would you, how should we do that? Oh, well, let, now let me suggest this, if I may, because we've already initiated those discussions. I mean, we're awaiting, we, COTPA, now are awaiting a proposal relative to those multiple options that we have, whether we're the owner of the shelter, whether it's privately owned, or whether it's a combination where perhaps we own it, they maintain it, and they advertise, or we own it, we maintain, they advertise. 
Um, once I get those numbers back and staff has had an opportunity to work with our, our contractor, I'd be more than happy to share that and to give you better, better data to work with. Rick, I just Rick, want you to know that that's already on, in process. Rick, I don't feel like I'm being impatient. You and I have had these conversations for a year and a half. And we've talked about talking with Tyler Media about a new model where we put out the money for the capital. So to say today that we need to start have discussions with Tyler for a year and a half, I've been saying this is coming. Let's talk to Tyler Media about a new advertising sharing model where we put out the capital outlay. This is not new. You and I have been talking about this for at least a year and a half. And I've been asking for the audit of Tyler to get the data that, to show, like David, to get the data and to have conversations with them for a year and a half at least about what, what could a new advertising sharing revenue system be like. Right. And, and, and in follow-up to that, you know, we have had those conversations. You know, that evolved into a completely new street furniture ordinance discussion that, that you had to approve. Then we went through the a select, trying to identify and select a model that would be so that we knew a base price for a shelter. So we had, we were talking in even terms there in terms of what would be acceptable and sharing that. So you're right. This has been in process for a long, long time. And if, and if, it was interpreted that this is something we're just now stepping into doing. That's certainly not the case. All right. Rick, thanks. Oh, just quickly. I know we're getting tired of this discussion. But in, in the studies I've seen, you know, what you usually like to see is large population bases in regards to designing a public transportation system and then large employment uh, locations and, and you take the large population to the large employment uh, areas and then back home. In theory, that's great. We're pretty diverse. Uh, I mean, we're about as spread out as any city that I know of as far as large employment bases. But one thing that I do think would help with our transit system is if we had a more vibrant retail center in downtown Oklahoma City and so I'm beginning to put the pressure verbally out on those who, who can help with that. If we had a stronger, more vibrant retail community in downtown Oklahoma City, I think that would draw more ridership down to one central location because uh, I don't think we're ever going to get a dominant place of employment, but certainly a stronger retail center in the central part of Oklahoma City then we're not concerned with having to transfer to get from southwest Oklahoma City to northeast Oklahoma City or northwest Oklahoma City because that doubles or triples the time on public transportation. But to bring people from all parts of the city uh, for one particular reason, and the only thing I can think of is just to uh, shop, uh, because it certainly was that way back in the 60s, 50s, 40s, people would use the public transportation system to come downtown to shop. I, I think that would be a very favorable event for our public transportation. And it would provide weekends, night type ridership. Uh, more money would be generated by the system through fares. Uh, and you could make it a very enjoyable process. Now, you still have a half mile walk from the bus stop to your home, but hey, that's OK, even if you've got a few bags to carry. But I do think we really need to speak with those, whether it's the Alliance for Economic Development, the Downtown Oklahoma City Chamber, or somebody, to begin putting a greater emphasis on developing a more vibrant retail sector in downtown Oklahoma City. And I know it'll happen once we get the boulevard and the convention center and the park and all that, but I, I do think that'll really help the system. And, and you're certainly right in Ward 2. I mean, when we look at like Penn Square, class at Belle Isle, there's 1,100 people a day. It, it rained all day yesterday. 1,100 people in the rain. Uh, it's, it's time to take care of, of those people. And, and, they, and you're right that it's at these big, at the Walmarts and the big retail centers, but that is a lot of people. I agree. And when I ride it, I've got the luxury of driving my car from my house to, you know, a shopping center and waiting for the bus and then getting out of it, out of my car to run to it. But most people don't have that luxury. So I, I certainly agree. And I think everybody on the council agrees with that sentiment. Uh, and I think we're trying to get to that point. Unfortunately, in government, it just doesn't happen overnight, it seems like. 
we can all agree on that. <laughs> all right, Rick, thanks. Thank you. At the October, uh, September 24th council meeting, at the end we were at items from council and, and we had, I'm not even sure how we got there, but we did have a discussion on fund balance. And you asked me to bring back an item on October 15th to discuss fund balance. And here we are, and I'd be happy to open that discussion. In the past, uh, we have used, uh, we do have $8 million that would be available to do uh, some type of capital improvements in, in, in this year's budget. And I do know that uh, Mr. Winger has gone around and talked to each you, of you to uh, talk about some of the uh, improvements that Public Works would recommend in each of the wards. There's plenty of streets that need to be resurfacing. That is our number one priority. And historically, over the last few years, we have used the money for resurfacing. We did pass a resolution a month or so ago that would designate uh, part of the fund balance in the Ward 6 allocation for a quiet zone designation. Um, and then the remainder of the money, again, we, we, we've uh, made at least observations or recommendations in regard to street resurfacing. Some have taken different looks at it. Uh, Council Pettis is trying to uh, leverage his with some county opportunities and funds to, to spread some out in, in those type of areas. So we're, we're pursuing that and, uh, with, with Council Pettis and uh, trying to respond to the, each individual ward's needs. Okay. I know the Council's had a chance to interact with the City Manager on this issue. Any additional items that want to be brought up today? Well, I, I'll just make this one comment. I promise you one comment. Uh, I, the whole system to me is flawed in that we've given this money to each councilman to pass around. Now, I know Larry's made an argument that that solves the problems, but I think that we ought to do the most important projects in the city in terms of what the Public Works Department decides the worst situations are and solve those first. And then we can spend the money, you know, that the money would be spent on a really need basis where we would have some competition between the wards to get the thing done. Now, Pat, I think my only commentary to that is there are enough severe needs in every ward that we would be doing worse projects, I think, across the city. I don't question that a bit, Meg. I know the streets throughout the city are not in good shape. But I do think that we would be better served if we allocated that money to the projects that are most needy and not the projects in our wards that are most. I recognize what you're saying, Councilman. I don't even know if I disagree with you, but I will say that of all the projects we're recommending in each of the wards, the band of the PCI index on, on those is it's a very narrow band. In other words, the, 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 the PCI index of the streets we're looking at, Ward 7 and, and, and Ward 1 and Ward 4, are, are generally, are generally uh, very close to each other. Yeah, I think we would get to the same answer that perhaps. Uh, well, and I'm saying. <laughs> All we have to do is let Eric go back and say, if I didn't have to be concerned by Ward, here's what I would get. And I don't know if it would vary significantly from what we're going to obtain on a Ward by Ward basis. Plus, it gives each one of us a little bit of input uh, or discretion on within our Ward, which areas we, we, we'd like to see, but I, I don't know if it would really vary much, and all we have to do is ask Eric to give us mm -hmm. his suggestion. I don't know why we don't ask him then. I agree with Pat. I, I'm i never able to justify doing it word by word. I've never been able to do it 30 years. I, I don't understand it, it seems to me. We just got through with Rick asking him to do the spend whatever money we had to put it in the bus shelters that were most, and they're not equally divided ward by ward. If you add up who gets them, where they, by ward, they're not going to be equal. Some are going to get several more than others are. It just seems to me, um, you know, I mean, one thing it might do is, is um, uh, I got a call from, uh, after the article in Sunday's paper, showing where the projects were, you know, the, and the guy got his, I got it from one of my frequent flyer complainers um, who, who said why, uh, why it's a, here's one more example of how our ward is not getting taken care of, how you're not doing a good job. And that's based on it being done based on the need citywide. Uh, at least, you know, I can say, oh, no, I brought home the bacon for you. Here, here I'm going to pave a mile out close to where you live because that's, that's where the worst road I have is. But I don't like that. I don't think that's the way it ought to be. I think it ought to be 
we ought to do, we're all in this together. I mean, and I think we ought to all, we ought to do the, we've got $8 million to spend. It ought to be on the $8 million that's the worst situation wherever it is. And I know I'm going to suffer from that. I mean, in terms of where the roads are built. Because I'm paving with my money rural roads that don't have high, they're bad shape. They're terrible. But they don't carry near the traffic that some of the roads that get that number up uh, where you carry a lot of traffic in a more urban area. But that's, I've always felt like that's the way it is. I didn't drive on a real nice four-lane road when I bought and built my house. I didn't see any fire hydrants, and I'm not going to start screaming about the fact that they're not there now. <laughs> there wouldn't be anybody to listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess I'm confused about when you say that, that you'd like to hear what's the highest priority from public works, is are we talking about just resurfacing? And, and if we are just talking about resurfacing, why? Because I have neighborhood association meetings that are, that are talking about how it, drain, it floods every time we have a major drain. And our engineers have been out there and they've said, you don't have enough drainage gutters and we just have to wait till the next bond. So A, I mean, if, we're, if, if Public Works is the only entity that gets to decide or that we're leaning on, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that that's the way to go, but if you did, why are we just picking the, the resurfacing projects? I mean, it seems to me that when we made the decision that we were going to spend 500000 on the quiet zone, that's all gone as a policy. I mean, would, would Public Works say that one of the highest priorities in the city is the quiet zone? I don't know, Ed, but I do, I think you're 100% right. It ought to not be devoted exclusively to street projects. We ought to consider drainage projects and the impact they have on our citizens right. as part of this overall look at thing. And the way it's set up right now, all we're doing is fixing streets, which are necessary to be fixed. I'm not arguing that at all. But I do feel that, that the drainage projects should be included in this allocation of money. And that's something that's not been presented to the individual councilmen by the Public Works Department. All they've talked about is improving roads. So I think I, I agree with your, your suggestion. I think Pete's way, the suggestion that he's made, is, is I totally agree with. And that is, let these projects fall where they may fall. Be our most necessary. I, I think one of the reasons drainage has not been in there is because it's much harder to quantify. You can quantify the roads with this system that we have where we evaluate and we can assign each road a number. Pretty hard to, uh, to assign a number to a drainage ditch. You know, so I think that's, that's the reason. But certainly it is the kind of infrastructure need that is as impactive on a, a neighborhood as is a road. There's no doubt about it. Larry? Yeah, I would agree with what you're saying, uh, but the, when, the reason I think, Meg, we, we approved the quiet zone was you said that in your ward, that was something that was very, very important, and you were willing to take the roughly $1 million and invest it in that quiet zone. And I would think that other council people uh, would, uh, would, would be able to look, in your case, in drainage and say, in Ward 2, drainage is real, real important. Mm -hmm. Now, we have drainage problems in Ward 3, but I got to tell you, $1 million, even $8 million, is not going to solve the drainage problems that we have. But $1 million properly applied in Ward 3, for example, would address the resident's number one complaint ward ways, which is the condition of the road. So I, I would say, you know, if you wanted to you know, do a drainage project in a neighborhood, but in Ward 3, quite frankly, the number one priority is arterial streets, and they have a need based on the PCI rating to have them, them done, and you can't do that many miles. We're talking about in a roughly, I think, uh, somewhere between two hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000 per mile to do two, two lanes of road to resurface it. It's not, you know, you're not going to be able to resurface miles and miles and miles. So I think the, the council person should have the uh, input along with Public Works on where the biggest need is in his or her ward. Well, just one more example, if I can get feedback from the council, is, I mean, when you say streets, I mean, we did a study with the University of Oklahoma Institute for Quality Communities. We did, you know, about how we could improve West, the Western Avenue streetscape. And it wasn't just resurfacing, it was also pedestrian improvements and um, making it more walkable, engaging in placemaking. I mean, that's, 
it's not just some random, I mean, it was a year-long study. So does the council feel like that qualifies as an appropriate use for streets? I mean, can streets be more than just resurfacing, but also pedestrian improvements, sidewalk improvements? Yeah, I would think so. I think we're to the point now where it can be anything a councilman says it wants to be. I, w I wouldn't get carried away. <laughs> no, I mean, I with, know, within, we're but reasonable it's not, people. When we have lost our, 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 we've lost our objectivity when we say this is just important. Well, we have needs that are much greater than this relatively small amount of money will address. Right. I think that's just that, that's kind of what this conversation is about. Right. Um, we do know that when we ask our citizens, you know what. What they look at as the biggest need, streets comes in really, really high. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we're kind of looking at as streets as kind of the primary opportunity here to, to, to address some of these needs. But these other needs are, are you know, it's, these aren't wasted dollars if they go to some of these other causes. So, Mayor, if I ask the people that live close to me what the biggest problem they have, they'd probably tell you it's the noise generated by planes landing at Tinker. Would I be wise to spend my million dollars to try to convince the federal government to change the way the planes land at Tinker? That'd no. Be I'd just love to see you try that. Well, I understand. I understand. I wouldn't try it because I, because I so think I'm going to encourage you just because I want to see no, that. No, I, I, I want to witness you'd the send process. Me another, you'd send me another birthday card if I did that. But, uh, but, I, but I, I, I don't, I mean, the Tinker was there from 1945 on, as the railroad was there from 1980, 1889 on. So it seems to me that, that that just, once we open it up to things that are that subjective, then we've really opened the gate on what we want to do. And if that's what the majority of the council thinks is fair, well, then I think I'm, I, I'll live with that. Well, you know, technically we have hundreds of millions of dollars at our discretion. We, just, right. we, we feel locked in based on right. past priorities. So, I mean, you know, it, it's it's not as if this is the only discretionary dollars we have. I, mean, I understand. Technically, there's a lot more than this, but I understand. It's this we're we're. But I can't I can't convince we're, any we're of discussing you. Discussing this particular amount a lot. I can't convince any of you to talk to me about people who tinker not flying over my house and waking me up. We can pass a resolution. Well, um, I can speak for for the the partnership with o Oklahoma County um, because uh, I plan to. A partner with Oklahoma County, I'm able to approximately uh, get to maybe 10 miles of roads resurfaces, resurfaced in my ward because I'm able to partnership um, with Oklahoma County. Yeah. I think that's great, John. Yeah. All right, ready to move on? All right, we have a a couple people that have signed up under Citizens to be Heard, Diane Bowers. Thanks for letting me speak. Yeah, sure. Diane, we'll need your name and address for the record, please. It's Diane Bowers, B-O-W-E-R-S. I live at 3740 Northwest 57th Street. You need the zip? No, thank you. Okay. I have uh, been riding the buses in Oklahoma City since 1974. That's going on 40 years. And I just bought a house, my house, about a year ago, so I plan on being here about another 30 years. So that's going to be a 70-year span that I'll be riding the buses. And that's because I have a disability, a uh, visual disability. So I know the progress of what's been going on with the buses, and I have that personal experience of being out in the rain waiting on the bus and being splashed by the bus. I had the personal experience of walking through mud and mud puddles to get to the bus, running my shoes and going to work with the bottom of my pants being wet and having to dry out. I have the experience of being out in 105 and 100 degree temperature, waiting an hour and a half on the bus and it never getting there. Just to go one mile to get home when I could have walked it and probably wouldn't have baked so much. So. I came to talk about the bus shelters because bus shelters are extremely important to bus riders. You should know and bus systems and bus shelters are not just for the people who have disabilities, who are in wheelchairs, who have scooters, who walk with a uh, support cane, 
who've had all kinds of medical problems that they need to get access to a bus shelter. They're for people who work every day, who they provide employment, they provide a way to get to your health care, to doctor's appointments, to grocery shopping, to other kinds of shopping. They are not limited to a mile square area in downtown Oklahoma City. People don't, everybody can't live in that one mile square area in downtown Oklahoma City. And I don't have any plans to move away from my area where I live because I am now within walking distance of work so that I specifically don't have to wait on the bus to get to and from work. That's the only option that I have. I don't have someone, a wealthy family, that could provide a chauffeur for me to go wherever I wanted to go. My job doesn't provide me enough income for me to pay someone to have a chauffeur to go to and from work or to and from groceries. I depend on public transportation, and I have all my life. I don't have any other options. So bus shelters and getting to them should be part of a general infrastructure that you would think about as you think about streets or utilities. When you think about city services, buses should be part of those city services. You shouldn't think about, well, we'll have to dedicate a few million for a fixed route bus system because public outcry would get us if we didn't. You should think about it as one of the infrastructure systems of the city. I'm here maybe to change your mind about that. Because if you think you have companies and businesses and investments, you have to get employees there and you have to get customers there. And buses are a very big part of doing that. I, accessibility, if you make it accessible for people with disabilities, you make it accessible for everyone. Buses need to be user friendly. It's like if you didn't, ATMs weren't user friendly for cars, people wouldn't use them. If they couldn't get there, they wouldn't go and use them. They wouldn't go get their money so they could spend it other places. Buses are the same for people who don't drive. So I would say that if you're looking at bus shelters, you need to look at how you get access, not just to build a cement platform that's out in front of that bus shelter and not be able to get a wheelchair to that bus shelter. I'm thinking of 23rd in Portland. Yeah, there's a cement walk for the buses, but there's no curb cuts at this, the intersection at 23rd in Portland to get to that sidewalk. If you think about the, the bus shelter at 23rd and Villa by Shepherd Mall, there's no way for a wheelchair to get up on that grass to get to the bus. I mean, what kind of thinking is that? So. There's all kinds of examples. If you're thinking about what are the minimum requirements for a bus shelter is, the very sketchy minimum that you should think about is what is now developed in the transit center at 4th and Hudson. There's curb cuts. There's signage that people can read and not be confused by. You know, for a long time, I didn't know there was a bus stop on 56th Street because there is just a bus sign. I didn't, couldn't see it. I had no idea. So I finally so one day saw someone waiting there. Well, with the new proposals, a lot of my stops are going to go away. So, and I'm going to walk further. And I'm used to walking. I've walked a lot of northwest Oklahoma City just because if there's no bus, the last choice is walking. So I know what that feels like. I commend Rick now that he's becoming more of an advocate for people with, who ride the bus and people with disabilities. And I'm happy to hear that he's thought about what, it co what it's going to take to really get an accessible bus shelter. I'm kind of uh, reluctant to say that it sounds like he's a little pessimistic in saying, well, we're not going to put it there if we can't provide accessibility. I know that on the east side of Portland, where they put in a new facility just north of 56, there's a three-foot gap on the north end of that sidewalk that they put in with a new business no wheelchair could get over to that grass and to that curb. So that's not a usable sidewalk. Have you ever thought about requiring a business? It's not to go three or four more feet to make the connection to the next driveway. You know, how much more is that? A couple hundred dollars? That just, it does, it's not reasonable. That's what I would say that I would try to convince you 
that you need to consider that bus systems, fixed route bus systems, need to be an integral part of the infrastructure for Oklahoma City. It's not going to do any good to have a commuter rail system that brings everybody downtown if you can't get them to where they work or to where they live, to their relatives and to their shopping. You have to be able to get them to and from downtown. Just coming downtown isn't going to get people to use that commuter rail system if they can't get anywhere from outside of there. And the second one, I think I would change your mind into looking more into the future and thinking about bus shelters that we have more accessibility on a virtual bus shelter that we know where buses are and when they're going to get there and how to use that system is much easier. That's a big part of those shelters. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Diane. Uh, William Gonzalez. William E. Gonzalez, 801 Caroline Drive, uh, Yukon, Oklahoma. <clears throat> Still in Oklahoma City limits. I want to thank the court and the uh, council for hearing me and thank uh, Larry for his fast response to me. Um, back in um, April of this year, I filed a informal complaint on the actions of an officer out of the Hefner Station and my response from the police department was from a lieutenant, no, it's Captain Carver or Carver, that uh, he thought I had a lot of conspiracy theories and that uh, he, um, I ought to be lucky that they didn't impound my car. And when I was complaining about the cost, uh, my son was arrested for CD, controlled deadly substance, which turned out to be underarm deodorant which cost me about $4,000 to fight. And so then after the, talking to the uh, police department, I finally filed a formal complaint. And the first officer they sent for me to talk to was Lieutenant Pisano, which was one of the arresting officers. I said, there's no way I'm going to talk to you about cover up and the planning of drugs on my son so he, he finally said, okay, they, they turned it back over to uh, Lieutenant Carver. And Carver said he would um, go through all the procedures and everything. And after the procedures were, they came back and said, we don't find anything wrong. But if somebody would sit down and look at just the facts of the situation, there's no way in the world they could find out that the drugs weren't planted on my son, which the cop thought was drugs, but they weren't. And it took the county or the district attorney almost four months, five months to get it tested. So we had to fight that for four months, you know, a lot of money, just because this officer decided he wanted to plant these drugs on my son. And I just wanted on record that I think that the city's covering up, or the police department's covering up the actions of an officer pool. Those are very serious allegations, and we will follow up on those very seriously. Chief City has just walked into the chambers, and I'll have uh, Chief City get with you to, to follow, follow up. And if, if that uh, response is inadequate, my office will get involved with you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh huh. We have executive session, and we'll be back. <laughs>